Fox Sports. We are Black Hawk. We are Florida. On a rainy night, the sun has poked its head out and some sunshine on the outside. Roof closed, AC on on the inside. The Mets and the Marlins. Jose Fernandez, all of 20. Matt Harvey, who has lit the National League on fire. And that's the matchup tonight. Hi, everyone. Rich Waltz, along with Tommy Hutton. There was a genuine buzz around batting practice for both of these teams in anticipation of this matchup. This game tonight, Rich, is going to have all eyes on it from a lot of baseball people around the country, scouts, executives, because of the two guys that are pitching and also because of a hot Giancarlo Stanton. And Stanton has been coming along over the last week, and he exploded on Sunday. And for the Marlins, uh, they've been desperate to get that bat going. You know, Rich, I think you and I talked about it in Minneapolis. We could see some at-bats. We could see some of the base hits that were starting to come, and you knew that once some base hits came, the power would be there. And boy, has the power been there the last couple of games. Look at the five-game streak. Three home runs, eight RBIs. He's already hit as many home runs in April that he hit in April of 11 and 2012. He hit three combined. So don't worry about Giancarlo. He's got balance. He's being real patient at the plate. Really curious to see how the Mets pitch him in this series. Let's talk about the pitching and let's talk about these two right arms. Now one's experienced in terms of college and a, a little bit of time in the big leagues. One is not. It's our Coventry Healthcare matchup. I tell you what, Matt Harvey, look at the numbers. Uh, a 154 ERA. Opposing batters are hitting 122 against Matt Harvey, who has all four pitches, and they're all really good. He's got seven or more innings, four of his five starts this year. And for Jose Fernandez, trying to come back a little bit after a couple of starts that weren't up to par for him. There were a couple of issues with maybe tipping pitches. He worked on some things in between starts. And remember, he made his major league debut against this Met ball club in New York at City Field and pitched very well. There you got Harvey, the college kid who's pitched a lot from double A, triple A on into the big leagues. And of course, Fernandez hadn't pitched above single A before this year. It's the fish, it's the Mets, Giancarlo Stanton. What's going right? Just killing it. Absolutely. When we get back, Jeff Conine, Craig Minervina will tell you why.
window shut as well. AC's up. So are the Mets. And so are the Marlins. And so are Craig Minervini and Jeff Conine. Gentlemen. Rich, you know, streaking was very popular in the 70s. But in baseball, it's always been part of the game in a different way. And for Giancarlo Stanton and home run headers, you really notice it when guys aren't going well and then all of a sudden they get on a run and, and he may be one of the most prolific home run hitters with that in mind. Yeah, very much so. You know, home run hitters kind of are streaky because they're swinging the bat a lot faster through the zone than most other hitters. So they're going to miss a lot more as well just yeah. because of that. So Giancarlo, what we've seen so far this year, I think, is more of a mental kind of uh, confusion than anything else than mechanical. You see these strikeouts right here. Both these pitches are out of the strike zone. When you're not thinking clearly at the plate, you're not able to see the ball as clearly out of the pitcher's hand, thus not being able to take these good pitches. Now look at these two home runs the last couple nights, and look where these pitches are, right down the middle, right in Giancarlo's wheelhouse. And anytime he puts the barrel on the bat on that ball in that strike zone and gets it elevated at all, it's going to go out of the ballpark and any ballpark. And it's just amazing how far this guy hits the ball. I mean, you watch the New York Mets yeah. come out today for batting practice, and they're all just <laughs> ooing and awing. And these are the best in the world. Yeah. And they're watching another guy do that, and they're like, I can't believe what this guy can do. Now we're way out in center field, and uh, Jose Fernandez told me before the game that he hit one around our set the other day. But you saw him hit one. I don't know if it was today. It was well uh, halfway up the, the windows out in left field. And, up the window, wow. And I, I, that would have gone out the entire stadium if the windows were yeah, open. I think he hit one yesterday with the windows open completely out in batting practice. If you had a chance, come on out and uh, catch him in BP, especially. And even I know a lot of Marlins fans on the road will get a chance because the road team hits a little bit later to watch him. And it is a sight to see. All right, hey, we got baseball coming up. Can the Marlins make it two in a row? If they're going to do it, they're going to have to deal with a tough pitcher and young Matt Harvey. Ball games coming up next. In Miami tonight, Marlins part terrific pitching matchup of young right-handers. Jose Fernandez, all of 20 for the Fish, and Matt Harvey, the 24-year-old sensation for the Mets. Here come the Mets. Let's meet them. Mike Baxter is in right field. Justin Turner's at third base. Daniel Murphy at second base. Lucas Duda in left. 
John Buck, the catcher. Ike Davis is at first. Ruben Tejada at short. Jordani Valdespin in center with Harvey in the nine spot. No David Wright. David Wright out with a sore neck tonight. Yeah, I think it's interesting, Rich. We build this as a couple of young pitchers, yet a 20-year-old Jose Fernandez against the 24-year-old Matt Harvey out of college. So a little different situation. But one thing we'll look for, and remember, he faced the Mets uh, in his major league debut and retired the first 10 that he faced. Pitch Penny brings you the first pitch. Mike Baxter digs in, and Fernandez with a fastball that misses low. Always got to be on a three-second delay. Tim McClellan behind home plate. Jerry Meals at first. Marvin Hudson at second. Jordan Baker, who's the umpire at third base. And a close eye, I would think, as you see Baxter, a close eye on Fernandez for everybody in the Marlins dugout on two things. How is he throwing, and is he giving away pitch selection? Is he tipping his pitches? Because the Marlins felt that quite possibly in his last couple of starts where he was rocked in Cincinnati and hit in Minnesota, that he might have been giving away the pitches. We'll see you tonight. Here's the 2 1 pitch. There were little subtle things. Maybe a, a, just a twitch of the glove as he uh, positioned his hand to get the grip on a changeup or a breaking ball. So they weren't real blatant, but things that uh, major league hitters and coaches and managers can see. He's gone 3 and 1 on Baxter with Justin Turner and Daniel Murphy right behind him. And he misses up, and Baxter is aboard. Come the Marlins defensively. It's brought to you by the Cleveland Clinic, Florida. Well, Justin Ruggiano in the outfield in center, flanked by Juan Pierre and John Carlo. Polanco and Nick Green, the power hitting Nick Green, homered in the ball game yesterday. Donovan Solano, Greg Dobbs, and Rob Brantley behind the plate. You hope that in trying to make the adjustments, which Jose did between starts, that he doesn't think about that too much while he's on the mound now during the game. Justin Turner getting the start at third base and Fernandez misses outside to him. The one thing the Mets are they're a pretty patient team. They have a good team on base percentage. Even though David Wright is out of the order. The Mets are fifth in the National League with a 317 on base percentage. So they will make a pitcher work. They will take their walks. And McClellan raises that right arm at strike one to Justin Turner. Yeah, David Wright, not uh, pleasing Terry Collins, I'm sure, to have to take him out of the lineup, but a little tweak behind his neck, just a little stiff, having a hard time turning his head. Terry Collins has done a very nice job as the skipper of the Mets. You talk to Major League scouts, you talk to people in the game, and they marvel at his energy, his ability to really squeeze as much as he's been able to squeeze out of a, a roster that at times during his tenure has been depleted. Baxter away from first and Turner couldn't hold up on the breaking ball. Brantley blocks it and it counts one and two. There's no question he committed. He was swinging fastball and got breaking ball. He's not quite Josh Reddick like or even Ryan Franklin like but the uh, the guy in the Quaker Oats box he's he's getting there. It's the redhead version of Jason Worth. There you go. That's a good one. Same division too. One two pitch runner bluffs and Fernandez misses in or at least that's what Tim McClellan felt. Here's a look. There's the defector and it's just on the black and at the letters. One thing Jose has been really good at first time through the lineup hitters are just three for 33 against him. Into center field well struck. Ruggiano has it and the Mets have a pair of runners on. Fernandez has yet to get an out and you got some. Left handed bats now and Daniel Murphy and Lucas Duda to deal with little early test for the 20 year old. He had a call that maybe he thought was a strike didn't go his way. And after the walk Turner single so now he's dealing with first and second nobody out. 
The Mets are not tearing the cover off the ball right now. They've dropped five of the last six. And they hit just 186 on the homestand. Murphy a, a little bit of a slide right now. He's 0 for his last 12. But he's still hitting 300. Seems like every time you look up over the last three, four years when we see Daniel Murphy, he's hitting 300. Murphy, as uh, many of you know, out of Jacksonville University, Englewood High School. And he swings and misses at a 95 mile an hour fastball. You mentioned, Rich, the uh, 186 on the homestand with runners in scoring position. Overall, they're, they're not too bad. 293 is the Mets' average with runners in scoring position, but they're in a tough stretch. They've lost four in a row. Baxter and Turner out there. Fernandez out in front, 0 and 2. And time is called. The disparity in terms of experience between Fernandez and Harvey is pretty dramatic. I mean, Fernandez had not made a start above A ball before he started in the big leagues this year. That one flipped foul and out of play. Harvey, on the other hand, went to the University of North Carolina, was a great Tar Heel, and made 32 starts above A ball on his way up into the big leagues. Is 24. You see Harvey, calm and cool, just waiting his turn. Six foot four, the Connecticut native. Well, you saw that last fastball that was fouled out of play by Daniel Murphy, 96 miles an hour. Breaking ball and that one pulled foul and almost got Tom Goodwin Mets first base coach. So after a 96 mile an hour heater. Good breaking ball down and in Murphy did a good job just to get a piece of that pitch. But the one thing the Mets are doing in this inning they're just. Making Jose Fernandez throw a lot of pitches. On Tuesday. In the cold on that afternoon. In Minneapolis, Fernandez threw 79 pitches, five innings, six hits, only two strikeouts. And remember when he uh, burst on the scene against the Mets on April 7th, he had eight strikeouts in five innings and 80 pitches worth. Tried to catch the corner, and it's one and two. Just off the plate. No David Wright in that Mets lineup tonight, but Murphy and Duda and then John Buck making up the heart of the order. Right now, the control, the command isn't there. <clears throat> Tries to come inside and misses way inside. Mike Redmond, Chuck Hernandez. The 2 2. Broken bat. Dobbs to first, and Fernandez gets the out. The Mets move the runners up, and now Fernandez has to go after Duda. And Buck with one out and second and third. You always like to watch little things. You like the alertness of Jose as he went over to cover first. Not an easy play for Dobbs or for Fernandez to get the throw, the overhand toss from a first baseman, but he also knew there was a runner going from second to third. So once he got that flip, he alertly looked around and caught the runner, saw him over at third base. Now Lucas stood up. Five homers already for Duda. He's driven in eight. Infields back. And he is uh, maybe the most patient hitter going in the big leagues right now. He leads the National League in pitches per plate appearance. 4.54. So he gets deep into counts. 
He's third in the National League in walks, but right now he's thinking RBI. One and one. Thank you for Terry Collins. If you're a Met fan, you you get to that fine line, especially with David Wright out of the lineup. Lucas Duda is not a great defender. He's not great on the bases. So what do you want him to do? You want him to drive in runs. But if he continues just to draw walks and get the on base percentage up in some ways that isn't going to help a whole lot. And I think it's more important especially with Wright out of the lineup. Well, the counts one and two right now you see your walk leaders Votto. Wright and Duda. See Votto up there but he also has. Brandon Phillips leading the league in RBIs. Well, remember, right behind Phillips is John Buck, who is on deck. And Fernandez gets him. Change up, and he went after it. 21 pitches in. He still needs another out. The interesting thing about this 21 pitches in, and I think that's the first change up he's thrown. Good motion, good arm action. And also a little fade the ball tailed away at a big strikeout. That's a terrific look. And super slow motion. So Fernandez has two important outs but here is Buck. Who's eight home runs. Has. Really stunned a lot of people. Buck goes after a fastball and fouls it. Out of play. Buck has split those home runs evenly home and road. Four at home and four on the road. You look at trends in hitters, and certainly the RBIs and home runs stand out, but the last 10 games for John Buck, just five for 35. So a batting average about 140, 145. He's got company. And the Mets have kind of been in a team wide slump last 10 games. Oh, one pitch. And there's your proof. The Mets at 186. The Nationals, not much better. And the Reds, of all people, at 216. It's a, hard to imagine the Nationals and the Reds having that uh, long a, a slump, having seen them in the last two weeks. Two and one. Well, for a, a young pitcher who is certainly on a pitch count, more so than any starter, 24 pitches and two outs is a, a red alert right now if you're sitting down in the bullpen. The Marlins are hopeful he can get out of this inning and then get back into a, a rhythm. Two and one to Buck. Well, there's a curveball and it misses. It counts three and one. Not a bad pitch. You see Fernandez at the back of the mound mouthing, wow. And some ups who call that low strike call that a strike. In front of the plate, that's where Fox Tracks measures, and that's where the strike zone appears. So let's see what he comes with three and one. Same pitch. Of course uh, Fox tracks uh, got a lot of play over the last uh, 24 hours concerning David Price and Tom Hallion. There are the numbers on John Buck that we were talking about. I third in the home run department second to uh, Brandon Phillips and RBIs and driving the ball all from a guy who last year hit 192. And had just 12 home runs all season as a Marlin. Hey, Mets catchers had five home runs all of last season. <laughs> all Mets catchers. Full count, two outs. Baxter and Turner still out there. And he got him with a high fastball. Well, it took him 27 pitches, but Jose Fernandez gets through, and the Mets stay off the scoreboard.
Atlanta survived the top of the first, and now we get a peek at Matt Harvey. The Mets right-hander will face this Marlins lineup. Juan Pierre in left, Donovan Solano slotted second. A red-hot Giancarlo Stanton hitting third. Placido Polanco hitting cleanup. No Joel Mahoney, a little bit of a hamstring issue. You got Greg Dobbs in his spot in the five spot at first. Justin Ruggiano in center, Rob Brantley behind the plate. Nick Green who homered yesterday at short, and Fernandez hits ninth. Well, we've heard a lot about this 24-year-old, uh, and he's off to an incredible start. Only two Met pitchers have uh, be began the season 5-0, and uh, Doc Gooden and Pedro Martinez. So Matt Harvey trying to join that group, making his uh, sixth start and final start here in the month of April, and he's already 4-0. Look at that bottom line. First time through the order, below 100, and overall, hitters are hitting just a buck. 22 against Harvey this year and Pierre takes a look at a 95 mile an hour fastball tonight you're seeing two right handers when the ball comes out of their hand it explodes with ease breaking ball Pierre was on it drives it out into right center Baxter is there and Mike Baxter makes the catch so an out and here comes Solano and here come the Mets defensively, brought to you by the Cleveland Clinic, Florida. We talked about Lucas Duda. He's in left. Valdez Spine, Jordani Valdez Spine, Mike Baxter, Turner subbing for David Wright, Tejada and Murphy up the middle, like Davis over at first, and a familiar face, John Buck, behind the plate. A rising fastball is up on Donovan Solano. The Marlins' bat sprung to life. Certainly yesterday, with the three home runs, two of them by Stanton. Solano had an RBI hit in the ball game yesterday as well. Rich, you made a, a good point. Jose Fernandez making his fifth start of the year. Matt Harvey had ten starts last year as a Met when he was called up from Triple A. Into the bat, and it's going to stay foul. And Tommy, you add to that. 32 starts in the minor leagues above single A in double A and triple A. And the, and the interesting thing about that for Harvey, in those 32 starts, he was just 12 and 8 with a rather pedestrian ERA at right around four. Last year in the big league time, the 10 starts, his ERA shrunk to 273. So he's like a hitter that has hit better in the big leagues. He's a pitcher that has pitched better in the big leagues than the minors and that is impressive. Let's check in on the uh, scouting report for the six foot four right hander power arm no question about that. The slider cutter kind of blend together and a former Tar Heel he won 22 games at the University of North Carolina. Breaking ball Solano went down and got it and he Dumps it into center field for a base hit. So the Marlins have a hit, and now they've got someone at first base with Stanton coming to the plate. And it will be interesting to see now, as you watch it, a good piece of hitting, as they say, around the batting cage. Yeah, because that was a good pitch. Break the ball down, away. It will be interesting to see now, Tommy, how the Mets approach Stanton. They went after him in New York, and he was struggling. Obviously not struggling right now, and Harvey goes right after him with a fastball, strike one. One thing, the Mets are seeing a different Giancarlo than they saw in New York with the way he's approached over the last five, six games. Solano not a big lead. And Harvey buries the breaking ball. His secondary stuff is terrific. We're talking about how the ball explodes out of his hand. But his changeup, his slider, not a lot of guys are getting hits on those pitches. Buck sets up in. And the fastball is a strike, and it was right on the outside part. Yeah, a couple of fastballs he's known for strikes, so Stanton's actually seen 
two decent pitches to hit. This one in a good spot, though, for Harvey. It's a good example with Tim McClellan calling the pitch a strike. It was a strike, but Buck had to reach across the plate to get it. Yesterday in our conversation with uh, Jim Joyce and his umpiring crew, they talk about how difficult it can be when an ugly pitch is actually a strike. And that was an ugly pitch because it missed the catcher's glove and the target so much, but it was a strike, and it was called a strike. So not an ugly call by Tim McClellan. No. The one two. Ah, and he couldn't hold up. High fastball. Stanton goes around. And Harvey has his first strikeout. Boy, think about it. He really missed with that to pitch too because the target buck set inside. He wanted a fastball in. Harvey misses up way out of the zone, but John Carlo couldn't stay away from it. So here's Polanco now. Solano is still at first. Starts him with a breaking ball and gets a strike. When you see 81, 82, 83 miles an hour, that's his curveball. His slider is a little harder than that, upper 80s. Blanco had the day off yesterday. For one coming. Ground ball up the middle. Tejada flips. Murphy is there, and the inning is over. Harvey and Fernandez scoreless through one. In high definition, brought to you by H. H. Greg. Marlins Park tonight. The marquee matchup of this series in terms of pitching. Jose Fernandez, Matt Harvey. Fernandez really had to labor in that first inning through 27 pitches. But he struck out Lucas Duda and John Buck to finish the inning. Mike Davis, Ruben Tejada, Jordani Valdez speed. This game tonight's a state troopers delight. A lot of radar guns. You work on that when you're off night last night? No, actually, I just thought of it because <laughs> I was being careful coming down to Turnpike today. <laughs> Davis, a notorious slow starter in April, though he does have four home runs. And Fernandez runs that one under his hands. It is 2 and 0. His last two Aprils, he's hitting a combined 177. But to Davis last year, once he got out of April, he wasn't much better in May last year, though, either. He hit 154 last May. 
He would finish the year with 32 homers and 26 doubles. That was after an injury filled 2011. But if Jose Fernandez isn't careful, he's only going to be able to pitch three or four innings here tonight. And he misses on four pitches to Davis. So leadoff walks in the first and the second for Fernandez. Any Wednesday Marlins game will get you 60% off if you're in on the Chevron Crazy Aids ticket offer. Fill up at a participating Chevron to get $8 home run porch or $18 home plate box tickets. Visit your local Chevron or Marlins.com Chevron for details. Restrictions apply Wednesday. This Wednesday, remember, is a 1240 start, and it's weather day. Marlins live start things at noon, and then the Marlins head to Philly for four, San Diego for three, Los Angeles for three. Tejada now. Tejada's actually on a five-game hit streak and a strike from Fernandez. Right now, it actually looks like he's a little more at ease and has better command of his curveball than his fastball, which is in contrast to his last two starts where he had trouble spinning the ball and getting it over for strikes in Cincinnati and in Minnesota. In talking to scouts that have seen all of his starts, there are times, especially in his last two starts, where he looks like a, or has looked like a 20-year-old thrower rather than the polished pitcher that we saw in his first two starts. And certainly he's shown flashes of that, of being that polished guy in Cincinnati and in Minnesota. And when you're 20 and you're two years out of high school, that certainly is a challenge. You know, when you're 19 and 20 and you're in A ball, maybe even double A, and you have a few little struggles, you can just rear back and throw. And you're going to get outs if you have his kind of stuff. But up here, it's a little more refined. Solano got a piece, and it trickles into the outfield on a hot smash off the bat of Ruben Tejada. So a base hit for Tejada. Davis ends up at second, and Fernandez ends up right back where he was in the first inning with Mets at first and second and nobody out. Yeah, this ball stung, and on that uh, fast infield, yes, if it's picked by Donovan Solano, there's a chance the Marlins can turn two. But this ball was hit really hard. It's a do-or-die pick, and it just gets away from Donovan. I think he surprised Nick Green with the throw at short. Davis did not advance after that throw, and he's at second. Tejada's at first. Well, he does not run well. Ike Davis doesn't run well. Jordani Valdespin. Valdespin takes a strike. Valdespin, remember last year? Valdespin had five pinch hit home runs. Well, he's found a new way for late game heroics. He had the game winning grand slam against the Dodgers just a few days ago. One of the bright spots on that homestand. That might be two. Solano Green's turn is in time. And Fernandez gets a much needed double play. And he gets to face the pitcher, Matt Harvey, now. Here's the learning curve. Starts one and two, as opposed on that last road trip in Cincinnati and Minneapolis. Command, command, command. If you just try to boil it down, but you're right, learning curve is exactly what it is, but uh, he sure needed that double play. Now, Harvey's not an easy out. He can swing the bat, but Fernandez gets him to pop it up, and this is exactly what Jose needed. Some quick outs, and he got three of them in just those last two pitches.
to buy Toyota. Let's go places. By AT&T U-verse TV. Check availability at 1 800 pick AT&T. Rethink possible. And by Just for Men Auto Stop, the foolproof way to get rid of gray. Camera 12 is in the house tonight as Miami and New York open up a three game series. And it's Jose Fernandez against Matt Harvey. You can see neither team has a run. The Mets have a couple of hits. Harvey had a strikeout in the first. He really has been something. I mean, all the numbers are just incredible. They jump off the page from a slender ERA of 154 to a 4 0 record in his five starts to his whip, which is the best in Major League Baseball. Walks and hits for innings pitched. He's at 0 0.6. Eight six. It's been fun doing a little research, reading some things about Matt Harvey. And one of the things that I read that I found interesting that his slider has been described by some scouts as Steve Carlton esque. Well, as soon as I saw that, I said, "Well, I've, I've got a guy sitting next to me who <laughs> saw a lot of those Carlton sliders from." A teammate's perspective. He would bury, of course, Steve Carlton, a left hander, would bury that slider down and into right handed hitters and just eat him up. And there's a good change up. It's a circle change. We had a good conversation with the uh, Mets pitching coach, Dan Warthen. And Dan was talking about. Not only Matt Harvey and the stuff he has, but Matt Harvey and the kind of person he is. And I, we've kind of heard that from everybody. He's a hard worker, uh, just a, a terrific teammate, a great guy, a young guy, and that stands out even more so than his stuff. One two pitch, Dobbs. Fouls it off. I had a chance to speak with John Buck about Harvey and asked him, I said, what has surprised you or impressed you the most? And he said, his secondary stuff and his ability to flip it on and off and throw it for strikes. And there has been no learning curve. He's been able to do it right from the get go. For a young pitcher who's just starting out in the big leagues, especially a hard thrower, Tommy. You don't see that much. A lot of young hard throwers. The, the thing that comes last to them are those secondary pitches. Dobbs trying to hang in there. The one two. Change up and a beauty. He saw some good change ups. He saw three change ups in that at bat. 89. A lot of guys so throw their fastball at 89. Terrific pitch. That's one of the similarities between Harvey and Fernandez is that their changeup lives upper 80s, as in 88, 89. <laughs> their changeup lives in the fastball neighborhood of some. Yes. Now, Ruggiano. Justin trying to get the bat going right now. And he goes after the sharp breaking ball. AT&T as always brings you the Twitter poll tonight. Have the Marlins turn the corner offensively. Hashtag yes Marlins. Hashtag no Marlins. Tommy and I always. Lob our votes out there. And I would have to say hashtag no. Here's the 2 2. Hashtag no because, you know, Stan had a great day yesterday. He drove in four runs. He had three hits and two homers. But the Marlins had just seven hits. So I don't I might, know. I might go with a strong maybe, though. <laughs> because if you, if you look at the first 13 games, the Marlins hit 154, average under two runs a game. 
And if you look at the last 12 games, the Marlins have won four, they've gone four and eight, but they've averaged just under four runs a game. A little bit better. But that's, so there has been progress. But they haven't turned the corner. They haven't completely turned. That's why they may be plus. They're approaching the intersection. Now we know he uses that change up to right handed hitters, too. And he uses it quite effectively. He has struck out three of the last four he's faced. So here comes Brantley now with two outs. This copyrighted telecast is presented by the authority of the Miami Marlins. May not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Miami Marlins. Brantley takes down low. Brantley getting the start yesterday was 0 for 4. Harvey's thrown that change up an awful lot tonight. And it counts 2 and 0. Yeah, just a, a tremendous repertoire. 97, that last fastball. We've seen some good change ups. We've seen some sliders and some curveballs. Brantley's back came to life on the road trip, especially in Minneapolis. He's sitting on a 2 1 pitch. Three and one to Miami's catcher. Those are the numbers on the road trip. Well, he had that nice game in Minneapolis. Had a three-hit game. Drove a ball to deep right center. And there's that delayed call by Tim McClellan. You could hear McClellan call the strike. Brantley had started towards first. Counts full now, three and two. Hey, Jim Joyce, he is not. That's amazing. But he is a good umpire. In consecutive games, the Marlins have had Jim Joyce and then Tim McClellan. Brantley barrels that up and rolls it into center field. Miami's second hit. It's a two out single. And shortstop Nick Green comes up. Give credit to Rob Brantley. That was a nice A.B. He got himself in a situation where he got the pitch up, stayed right on it, drove it uh, into center field. So a good AB. Green slammed one to deep left. His first home run is a Marlin. And Harvey misses away with a breaking ball. Even with Harvey throwing the ball pretty well, having not seen him in all of his starts, I'm sure the Mets are saying, you know, he's not as sharp as we've seen him in this one tonight either. Terry Collins, who has such a diverse resume as a skipper of the Mets. He even worked a year in player development with the Mets and, yeah. and knows some of these young players. And the biggest influence for him, Jim Leland, because he was on Jim Leland's staff in those years in Pittsburgh where they came so close in 92 and 93. That's why Terry Collins wears the number 10 on his jersey in honor of Leland. Looks like Detroit starting to uh, get it in all gears. Actually, the Tigers right now trail Kansas City by half a game. Liner into right. Green smacks a hit. And he's aboard. Brantley moves up to second. And here comes Fernandez. Now this should be fun because Fernandez has really taken to hitting. Here's a look at Green's 
work. Last two base hits, the one by Brantley and the one by Green have been pitches up. So the command right uh, for Harvey isn't there either. But you're right. Uh, watching Jose take BP and the advance we've seen in games, he doesn't get cheated. And he, unlike most pitchers, likes to hit in the cage day of start. So he was in the regular rotation during batting practice, even though he was starting tonight. And a swing and a miss. 90 mile an hour breaking ball. Of course, that was Tino Martinez pitching. Not Matt Harvey. <laughs> but he can find those seats. He can find the home run sculpture. You know, Harvey isn't going to mess around with fastballs. He figures he'll throw him two sliders. Well, word gets out that he's a, a really aggressive swinger. And he's going to swing as soon as it comes out of your hand. So he hasn't seen anything real good to hit. And he tripled up on the slider. And it counts one and two. Jerry Meals down at first base. Three strikeouts for Harvey. Three hits for Miami. They've all been singles. And none have caused any damage. All right, Tommy. He's he's he threw three sliders, missed with a fastball. I think he's almost in a situation that Fernandez is. He might have a little better command of that breaking ball. Let's see if that's what Fernandez gets. Yeah, he did. And got the slider. The kid was on it and fouled it back. Albeit a 90 mile an hour slider. That's that slider cutter blend that kind of goes together. Feel like a hybrid pitch? Yeah. Another 2 2. Another slider, and again, Fernandez stays on it. Now, remember that first inning in which Jose Fernandez threw 27 pitches? Well, guess what? Look at what Matt Harvey has approached now. 30 pitches here in the second, 44 in the ballgame. So both young starters have extended themselves. Fernandez sits at 38 pitches. This will be number 45 for Harvey. And you know I was right. Having a heck of an at bat. I was right. This is a fun at bat. Yeah. And, and you see the, the fastball 96. He's been all over the place. And it's been a good battle. And you still get the feeling you have to be ready for the fastball. You still get the feeling he might go back to that slider because he's had better command of it. That's how he got the first two strikes of the at bat. Brantley's at second, Green's at first. They'll be on the move. And Fernandez steps out, Harvey steps off. Three two on the way. That slider again, and he got him. The Marlins pushed the pitch count up, but still no runs in this ballgame.
I have this thing on just in case. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's up with David? Neck? It's back? Neck, yeah. Oh, you're mic'd up. I can't tell you. Oh, here we go. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna tell his dad. He's wearing fake diamonds on, on the field. That's a Mets fan right there, boy. He's probably been waiting for a month to say that. <laughs> he's gonna. Can't wait to go to the Marlins game. I'm gonna get on Ike right out of the shoot. He's got an Ike Davis jersey too, by the way. That's pretty good. Oh no! Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's pretty good. The Mets fan on pick, Ike Davis. Pick out the Mets fan who's getting on Ike. <laughs> if you're just happening by this ball game, you might want to stick around because two of the top pitching prospects in all of baseball are in the big leagues and on the mound tonight. Jose Fernandez, the 20 year old who escaped from Cuba amid a hail of gunfire, saved his mother who fell into the ocean. That was his fourth escape attempt. Got to Mexico. Relocated to Tampa. He's got the top of the order coming up. Once he got to Tampa, when he got to Alonzo High School, he took three English classes each year. And his English is outstanding. Orlando Chinea, we talked to him. Remember in New York how proud he was? The family oh, yeah. of uh, Fernandez was there as well. Tanea, the Cuban pitching coach who defected earlier, same boat as Kendra's Morales, and worked so hard and did such great work with Fernandez. Counts one and two. Well, just adjusting to the elements as he had to do in Minneapolis in his last out. So he's still struggling with that fastball. Has not thrown many fastballs for strikes. One of the things that impressed us in his first two starts, and even in spring training, his ability to repeat his delivery and his release point, and that's not been here tonight. That's one of the tenets that uh, Chenea talked about that he really tried to instill in Fernandez. 2 2. Good breaking ball. Boy, just some terrific numbers after those first two starts. First pitcher, 20 years old, to allow one run or less and three hits or less in his first two major league starts since a left hander, Rudy May, back in 1965. Opening up, flying, fastball tailing up and away. Is that why he has a little more success in throwing the breaking ball for a strike That's right why now? We've seen the change up in the breaking ball more for strikes. It's his fourth three ball count tonight. At this rate for both starters the bullpens will be in in the fifth or the sixth. There's a good change up. And he gets the strikeout of Mike Baxter. Let's check in with Craig Minervini. Craig. Hey Rich, the Marlins played their second Sunday home game of the year yesterday. One guy appreciated playing right here, Juan Pierre. I never thought a big game in South Florida, a Sunday day game where nobody's just drenched and drained after. Even the cameramen, the reporters, <laughs> vendors, everybody would be uh, drained after those games in um, Sun Life. But uh, it's a little bit cooler here, and um, uh, I'll, I'll definitely enjoy it better. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll keep you young. And Mike Redmond also talked about that from his days as a catcher on those Sunday afternoon games. Remember, years ago, they switched around with the time. They went to 3 o'clock. There was 6 o'clock. They had a special exception because of the weather to go a little bit later. And then they went settled back to 1 o'clock. So obviously now with the roof, great conditions for baseball. And it's been a nice little atmosphere on Sunday afternoons here at the ballpark. Guys? Thank you, Craig. JP out in the left. Enjoying the AC. Turner takes low. Justin Turner always has been a, a terrific hitter coming up through the minors. A career 309 average. Very good pinch hitter as a Met. Rolls it out to Solano, gobbles it up. Fernandez has a couple outs here in the third. The Mets come into this ballgame at 10 and 13. 
And as Tommy pointed out, they've lost four straight and five of six. So the Mets were living high up until about a week ago, but still. Terry Collins and the Mets. Be a better start than many anticipated. There's Daniel Murphy. So you talk about the bullpens getting involved. The Mets bullpen ranks 29th out of 30 teams in the major leagues. But the only guy throwing well is Bobby Parnell. They're closing. Fernandez just misses. But there's no question we'll we'll see both bullpens tonight. One and two. To New York second baseman Daniel Murphy. See where that fastball is up and away. Release point isn't where he would like it to be. That's tomorrow night's matchup. Jeremy Hefner. And Kevin Slowey. Can you work Hugh into the scouting report this time? No, I think it ran its course. I know. You, <laughs> <laughs> you sprung that us on us in yeah. New York. We do the change up on two and two. I, I'd be surprised if he throws a fastball here. Looks like another changeup. And a gorgeous one. Yeah, he just really doesn't feel he has command for him, but a beautiful changeup. Four strikeouts for Fernandez. And still a scoreless game. Está disponible por SAP. In Miami tonight, Matt Harvey and Jose Fernandez, while they haven't been smooth, they have kept each team off the board. Both pitch counts are up. Harvey goes to work here in the third, and he gets the top of the order. Juan Pierre, Donovan Solano, Giancarlo Stanton, second time through for the fish. Pierre's fly ball out to right. Solano single back in the first. Miami had a couple hits in the second. But Jose Fernandez struck out to end the inning. That would be strike one on Pierre. Harvey now at 47 pitches. Fernandez at 55. Right back up the middle into center field. Pierre is aboard. And certainly the Marlins have designs on getting him to second base. This is a uh, perfect approach for Juan Pierre. Stay on top, right back up the middle. Joe Espada all mic'd up. Get through there, ball. Out of way. 
So the Marlins able to do something that Harvey's done a lot of this year. He came into this game, he'd had 16 one, two, three innings. And the Marlins have had a base runner or two in each of the first three innings. Solano taking a long look. You've got Stanton on deck. Pierre has six stolen bases this year. And it's 2 and 0. Oh. The leader of the pack in one, two, three innings. And we'll probably see him in L.A., Clayton Kershaw. Look forward to seeing him in L.A. Up and in. And so Harvey, just like Fernandez, is having trouble with his fastball, of all things. And both pitchers have used secondary stuff to get outs. That's really interesting. Both have struggled with that number one, the fastball. Harvey's used the slider and his changeup. Fastball letter high. And Fernandez has kind of resorted to the changeup a little bit more. Three and one with nobody out. I wouldn't be surprised to see Juan Pierre take off. A little run and hit. Pierre runs. Solano hits. And lines it foul. And out of play. You like what Juan Pierre is doing there. You see him looking over his shoulder as he heads back to first base. Looking at Joe Espada. You want to get the sign right away as soon as possible because Joe may have to then relay a sign to Donovan Solano. So JP get the sign fast before he gets back to first base. Well, if he was running on three and one, odds are he's running on three and two. You bet. Harvey ready. Pierre runs. Solano drives it into right center field. Pierre around second. Up with the ball, Valdespin. And Miami is set up at the corners with nobody out and Stanton coming up. We've seen some young hitters tonight have some really nice swings. Solano has two hits. Rob Brantley had a nice approach and a base hit back in the second inning. Fastball up, he sends it the other way, and boy, this sets the stage nicely for Giancarlo. Up, 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 up! Find it! Solano, a two hit night. Now remember, Stanton struck out back in the first. And Harvey was, at that time of the game, able to throw his fastball for strikes. Stanton saw a couple of pretty good ones. Yes, he did. He got a fastball. And Stanton at 97 miles an hour cracks it foul. Mets outfield incredibly deep and towards right center. Sharp ground ball. That'll be two, but Miami's on the board. Pierre scores 1 0 Miami. Another pretty good pitch for Stanton to hit, and he did hit it hard, unfortunately, on the ground right to Murphy. Got a high fastball, there it is. Murphy could have had him play it more perfectly. And it became pretty academic, but the Marlins get the run on the double play. So the bases are now cleared. Polanco is up. 
And Harvey's slider is a strike. It's a three game series tomorrow night, 6 30 Marlins Live. And then remember on Wednesday, noon start for Marlins Live, 12 40 first pitch. Jose Fernandez has a run. Maybe the Marlins can score some runs for Kevin Slowey tomorrow night. That one pop foul and out of play. The Nationals and the Braves opening up a series tonight. And that one is in Atlanta. And they're into the fourth inning. The Nationals have a 2 1 lead. I believe that's a uh, Stephen Strasburg start. Little tapper. Harvey gathers it in and gets the out. But Miami is on the board. A couple of hits and a double play grounder and a 1 0 lead after three. Remember on Wednesday, that's the first of May, it's a 12:40 start and it's CBS 4 weather day at the ballpark. You can take advantage of the Chevron Crazy 8s offer. Get an $8 home run porch ticket or an $18 home plate box ticket with your receipt of eight gallons of gas. Visit your local Chevron station for more. Go to Marlins.com as well. Here into the fourth goes Jose Fernandez and he gets Lucas Duda. John Buck and Ike Davis. The Mets have managed two hits. And Fernandez has walked a pair and struck out four. Much like his counterpart, Matt Harvey, Fernandez has had trouble commanding his fastball and missed with that first fastball. A strike on the inside corner. The Houston Astros are in New York in an American League tilt. And the Jose Altuve led Astros are up 5 0 over the Yankees. Boy, they're taking apart to Andy Pettit in that game. Who started for the Yankees. Carlos Pena with an RBI triple. Two one. And Fernandez misses away. Three and one. What a lesson and a, a great time to learn. You see the, the real veteran pitchers over the years. Watch guys that haven't had it early in the game, don't have the command, but they're able to, to work through it while yep. they're on the mound. And instead of waiting to work on those things in between starts. That looked like a batting practice fastball from 
Fernandez, it was 93 miles an hour. His fastball is normally 95, 96. And it runs away. Duda is aboard. Now, this is the fourth time the Mets have come to bat. And that's the third time that Fernandez has walked the leadoff hitter. Which just means extra workload. Pitching coaches, managers will talk about stressful innings. Well, Fernandez has had two very stressful innings, the first and the second, and it started with leadoff walks. Yeah, so a lot of times that pitch count means a little bit more if you're dealing with a lot of stressful innings. I think you could say that about both Harvey and Fernandez. Both pitchers, tonight. yeah. You could probably say that about the bulk of the season so far for Mike Redman, Chuck Hernandez, and his staff. A lot of stressful innings. As the Marlins try to to get it going. Buck was a strikeout victim in the first. We've been talking about the, the trouble that Jose has had with the fastball. Missed badly with that fastball. Now you see one's up and away. You got a, a strike on that one. The missing away. Again, away. We've seen a few more of those up and away. So that's been the troublesome pitch for the youngster in this one tonight. A one pitch on the outside corner. Is that with like changeup? Is that like trouble with the curve? That was the. The Clint Eastwood movie where he was the major league scout the uh, scout on his uh, the, the old veteran scout they thought was on his way out. No this was trouble with the fastball. O2. That's one of the better fastballs location wise that he's thrown lately 96 miles an hour. Buried low and on the inside corner. Fernandez ready. O2. Buck lays off. Yeah, the April record for the Mets. The number of RBIs is 26 by Jeff Kent. So John Buck right now three behind that. And it's rare that a catcher has such RBI totals. The last catcher in baseball to have at least 23 RBIs in April was Pudge with the Rangers back in 2000. And he had 25. Hadn't gotten over 100 yet in Texas. So he was still pretty cool with half of those games at home, I'm sure. Buck drives one deep. Left center field. Goodness. A colossal home run by John Buck. And the Mets grab the lead 2-1. to one. Nine home runs for Buck. Two more RBIs for Buck. What a month of April for the Mets catcher. Well, it was a fastball, 95 miles an hour. But when you see the location, it wasn't where Jose wanted to put it. Wanted it away, middle of the plate. And you mentioned it, Rich. The Mets catchers combined last year for five home runs. There's number nine for John Buck. John Buck paying a visit to the home run sculpture. That one landed right in front of the sun. Very similar to that one Dan Ugla hit last year that hit the sun. That's right. Ugla's burned up in entering the sun's atmosphere. Yeah, on ascent. Yeah. And so Buck with a another home run. And it's a 2 1 lead for the Mets. Wow. 
Ike Davis. Ruggiano looks up. And he makes the catch. Just the second home run that Fernandez has given up, and this is start number five. I remember, he gave up that home run in his last outing. The ball hit by Oswaldo Garcia. Here's Ruben Tejada now. Time called. Either uh, Tejada clipped Brantley or Brantley nudged Tejada, but Tim McClellan wanted to make sure everything was okay between the two. The early returns on the Buck home run is 439. Chopper. Polanco sets and gets the out. Two outs here in the fourth. Jordani Valdespin coming to the plate. Hey, you still love the demeanor that Fernandez has out there after that Arcia home run in Minnesota. He retired the next three hitters. So he didn't let that affect him and he's come back and made some good pitches to get Davis and Tejada here. Valdez being running up as if to slap at it takes a strike and it's 0 and 1 the energetic Valdez being out of the Dominican Republic San Pedro de Macariz which long ago was the island of shortstops but the Dominican Republic has produced so many great pitchers great players that uh, no longer known as uh, just a shortstop factory. Valdez speed himself can play short. He can play just about every other position. Goes down on an 0-2 pitch, fouls it back. Seventy-five pitches, and there are two outs here in the fourth. Curveball misses outside, and as we pointed out, in this the fourth inning, he's had three stressful innings. But the same could be said of Matt Harvey. Hey, the amazing thing about that: 75 stressful pitches could equate 100 easy pitches. That's why it's it's always hard to just put a, a hard number on pitch count because you don't know what kind of pitches they're going to be. And there is Harvey. As he waits on deck. Harvey has thrown 60 pitches in his three innings. Fastball up. And again, missing to a lefty up and away. So if he stays with his pattern, he'll probably go with a change up here to Valdez. Me. Tim McClellan was putting two fingers up as if to say the count was two and two. Scoreboard at three and two, but McClellan and now the scoreboard in the ballpark has changed to two and two. Fastballs out and. It's outside. Now our truck is saying that that's ball four, but Valdez Bean is still in the box. And no one in the Met dugout is questioning that. They're not questioning Tim McClellan. Here's the 3 2. It's fouled off. Well, I suspect 
as you look at the Fox tracks. Well, it's hard to tell which one of those were strikes. Four, seven, six, and eight were told he did not swing at. He fouled off pitch number nine. And that one is popped out behind short. Something tells me we're going to see a pitch by pitch when we return to solve this mystery. No mystery about John Buck. He's just flat out hot right now. And he hammers this one to left center field. 2 1 Mets. Visit your Honda dealer for great lease and finance deals on fuel-efficient Hondas. And by Checkers, feast on. In Miami tonight, Matt Harvey, Jose Fernandez matched up. John Buck taking matters into his own hands, giving his young starter a one-run lead with a two-run homer. Buck he has got to be the player of the month. I mean, I mean, I know there are guys at big well, numbers. Justin Upton may, uh, ah, yeah, may jump right. in there with his 12 home runs. You're right. It's got to be the catcher of the month. <laughs> How's that? I'll go with that. Okay. Catcher of the month, John Buck. Nine homers, 25 driven in. Here's Dobbs, and he flips it foul and out of play. Dobbs, Justin Ruggiano, Rob Brantley against Matt Harvey here in the fourth. Harvey has had trouble with his fastball, though he hasn't walked anybody. That one sails up and away. Yeah, he has the uh, he has the same affliction <laughs> with the fastball. Change up and it's down. Dobbs a, a good take. And he gets himself into a 3 1 count. The mystery of the Valdez being at bat. We're about to unravel. Unravel it. 3 1. Dobbs all over and he drills it in the cap into right center field. It's going to the wall. Let's see Dobbs run. Off the wall. And Dobbs will pull in with a double. So Miami comes right back with a leadoff double. Dobbs puts himself in scoring position. Now you've got Ruggiano, Brantley, and Nick Green. The Marlins have really done a nice job in getting to those counts and getting a good pitch to hit. And when they've gotten that pitch, they've drilled it, hit it hard. And this one finds a gap, and Dobbs starts things with a double.
Ruggiano struck out, and it was sliders that Harvey featured in that Ruggiano at bat in the second inning. Let's see what he gets here. It was a slider, and he pulls it foul. Three home runs, ten driven in. This is a situation two in and at bat. And you and I have both had talks with with Mike Redman about these situations. You want Ruggiano to, to try to drive in this run. You don't want him to give himself up because you're getting near the bottom of the order. You might have to pinch it for Fernandez. So you want a guy who's been driving the ball pretty well has 10 RBIs. You want him to give it a shot. Counts one and two. Dobbs a leadoff double. Miami has six hits against Matt Harvey. They scored their run in the third, a couple singles and a double play ground ball. Ruggiano with a good cut. The best cut that he's had so far tonight. The six hits by the Marlins, the most that Harvey's allowed in any of his starts this year. Another slider and another strikeout. And that pitch has been devastating to Ruggiano tonight. All right, let's go back to that Valdespin at bat. Let's see if there, in fact, were four balls, and he did walk. Here's pitch by pitch. That's strike one. Strike one. Strike two. Then you have a foul ball. Ball one, one and two. Ball two, two and two. Ball three, three. two. Foul ball. Yep. All four. There were four balls. <laughs> and he ended up popping out as Brantley busts his bat on a little trickler foul up the line. So the scoreboard was wrong. Tim McClellan was wrong. Both dugouts, well, at least the Mets dugout wasn't on it. But our Bill Wadelick, who operates. The Fox box doesn't miss a beat and he didn't budge. You know the pressure was to go to two and two. Wade didn't budge. He, he held his ground stood firm. Fastball misses up. That's why Tommy last year he was selected as an alternate. For the Major League Baseball All-Star game for. Fox Box operators. Had anything happened to the All Star Fox Box operator, he Wade was, Lick, he'd have been ready to go. He'd have been on a plane. Brantley trying to drive in this run. Dobbs is at second. Brantley fouls it back. Rob had a base hit back in the second. Nick Green is on deck. The Marlins, as we pointed out, with their six hits, the Mets have three. One of those, though, did major damage. And that was the John Buck two run homer. About 440 feet worth of a John Buck two run homer. Breaking ball in. It's two and two. Change up and that got him. So Harvey's gone to that secondary stuff to get the strikeouts here. A terrific slider to Ruggiano and this devastating changeup. Where the bottom just falls out of. That's a tough pitch for a veteran hitter. And this time he gets the best of Rob Brantley, who got the best of him back in the second.
Now Green. First base is open. Pitcher on deck. And Harvey buries a breaking ball. Remember, Green drilled the ball into right field for a single. His last time up. We'll see what Mike Redmond has up his sleeve if Green isn't pitched to. And the pitcher spot comes up. Oh, Green swings at a pitch way out of the strike zone. That's what you don't want to do is, is help Harvey out. Tom Kohler ready in the pen, so Redmond can pull the trigger for a pinch hitter if he chooses. But Green has to obviously reach for that to happen. It's that fine line for a pitcher in the bullpen, too. Put yourself in Tom Kohler's situation. He's not sure what Redmond's going to do, but he has to be ready just in case. Pitchers will tell you they'll they'll get close to heating up. But you're right, you don't want to throw 25, 30 pitches at, at full bore and be ready to rock and roll and not come in and have to sit down for two innings. But he knows if Mike Redmond pinch hits for Fernandez, that process will give him time. Or he was up as a decoy, so they would pitch to Green. That's out. Yeah, it looks like Jose's going to hit. And Kohler was merely a decoy. So as a decoy, he was down there. And wow, that was called a strike. <laughs> I think everybody on the diamond felt it was a ball. Here's a look. Boy, it's out Boy. of the zone, and McClellan calls it a strike. Wow. But Green didn't hear anything. And so the count's now three and two. And it, Red, it, Redmond's cover's been blown. I know, so it's just about to say. <laughs> <laughs> because Fernandez was headed up to hit. Now the 3 2. Fastball up, and he did walk him, and Fernandez is coming up. Well, remember the at bat that Fernandez had against Harvey. It wasn't 1 2 3, down he goes. Green is aboard. Dobbs still at second, and here's Fernandez. And the pitch is up. Now, this was the last at bat, an eight pitch at bat. And all of the swinging strikes that Harvey got were on sliders. Fernandez, in the middle of that at bat, fought off a couple of wicked sliders. But you see, pitch number eight was the one that he went after to finish the at bat. And Warthen is out. I think if he sees the fastball, he's going to make some good contact. Well, Harvey's thrown 82 pitches. Fernandez has thrown 81 pitches. So both young starters. It's funny, it hasn't turned out to be the, the pitching matchup that everyone anticipated, but it's still a close ball game and a good ball game. And a low scoring ball game for that matter. You, I mean, if you're if you're just perusing scores and you see this one, you think, oh, geez, these guys must be really throwing gas. Maybe they scratch out a run or two. Here's a 1-0. That's a strike. Little tapper up the line, and it's a foul ball. Just foul. And Fernandez is going to have to come back. And Fernandez getting up the line quickly. 
So he's going to take his time getting back and then also if he makes this last out or if he gets a base hit transitioning to go back out to the mound to pitch what will probably be his last inning. And for the Mets Matt Harvey's their first hitter up in the fifth inning and you have to have the feeling Terry Collins will probably pull the plug on him with the number of stressful type pitches he's thrown. All right, what's he going to get? Fastball or slider? Buck set up out, and that's the slider. And you get the sense that Fernandez has seen it enough now that he's able to identify it. Whether he can hit it or not is another. That's another issue. Look, look at the buy inning. Mm. Now a 2 2 coming. He got a piece. You know, it, it almost seems like if if Harvey felt he could throw that 96 mile an hour fastball consistently for a strike, he'd be throwing it right now. There's Dan Worthen. Two two. And that's the slider again. So Harvey with the slider. Strikes out Fernandez. Marlins waste that leadoff double. 2 1 Mets. We're back after the sports injury prevention message from the Cleveland Clinic, Florida. Now remember Fernandez was on deck Kohler was in the bullpen but when Nick Green went up to talk to Joe Espada this is what he learned. Make sure make sure I send them. Vamos vamos tu juego vamos. Traelo aquí vamos. Espada actually had a conversation with Green. And here it is. Yeah, it was a strike, but Red is not pinch hitting here for Fernandez, yeah. you know. So if he's if he's close, try to drag somebody in. So Kohler was up as a, as a decoy for that, and one of the one of the reasons for that is a couple of reasons. But with Kohler as a as a decoy, Mike Redman has a short bench tonight. We're not sure of the possibility of Mahoney being able to pinch hit, and the only other left-handed bat would be Chris Coughlin. And then you have righties. So Kohler does come in. And with that short bench. Mike Remen didn't want to burn a pinch hitter in the fourth inning. Harvey is up and Matt Harvey takes a strike. On the outside corner. The Cholula hot sauce spotlight. Connecticut native grew up a Yankees fan. Didn't sign with the Angels. When they drafted him. Opted to go to North Carolina instead, and the Mets, the seventh overall pick back in 
2010. So Terry Collins trying to get one more inning out of Harvey. And Kohler in the ball game a lot sooner than uh, certainly he expected. Mike Baxter, Justin Turner to follow. Kohler's fastball swung on and missed. So Kohler gets a strikeout. A John Buck two run homer is the difference in this ball game. And here is Baxter. One of the things I know when you and I talked to Chuck Hernandez in spring training about some of the pitchers. He loves the tenacity of Tom Kohler out there. Got a good arm. And I think we've seen that. Little tapper Dobbs flip Kohler there and Miami gets the out. Time now for the Jester men auto stop foolproof stats. Matt Harvey at four and oh. Jerry Kuzman Tom Seaver John Matlack Sid Fernandez Dwight Gooden look at the names on there. It's to a start at four and oh pretty good pitchers in that Met history. Wasn't too long ago, Tom Kohler. He was in Double A Jacksonville in 2010. Had a tremendous season. He was 16 and two with a 2.61 ERA. Stony Brook. All the matter of Tom Kohler. He's a guy too, Rich, that's been reasonably healthy coming up in the in the minor leagues. Look out, Turner's bat hit the screen and then flew into that first row of seats. State Fullerton at the alma mater of Justin Turner. And he was on that national championship team back in 2004. Two out walk. That brings up Daniel Murphy. The Mets are playing without David Wright tonight. He has a, a sore neck, a stiff neck. No indication as to whether he is available to pinch hit. So you're not quite sure you get into the late innings. If Terry Collins has right at his disposal you, with a neck injury or anything that's stiff or sore like that. Obviously in the course of uh, three or four hours from the time a manager makes the decision it can loosen up. And a guy can be available and as it stands now for Terry Collins. The makeup of his bench is all right handed hitters. Jose Fernandez went four innings. Three hits, two runs, three walks, four strikeouts, and of course the two run homer by John Buck, the big hit. Fernandez ERA sits at 4 5 0. Oh. Murphy takes, and the count is 1 and 1. So that was a, an interesting bit of of strategy things that were going on in the Marlins dugout in that scenario that took place last half inning. 
Well you've got a manager working with a short bench. We talked about Mahoney's hamstring injury. Yeah Joe Espada telling Green that. Redmond was not going to pinch hit for Fernandez even though Kohler was up in the bullpen and maybe the Mets felt that way. It's a good example of uh, a lot of times the number eight hitter has to do that has to expand the strike zone and maybe chase a pitch that's uh, borderline to try to drive in a run. Ground ball tricky hop Polanco went up to get it and he throws across in time. An uneventful fifth for Tom Kohler halfway through 2 1 Mets. Not nearly as energetic as the energy team. Yeah, not not really hard to keep up with them, Rich. But uh, these guys certainly are. Ray Del Canelio is the CEO of the Little Warrior Project.org, and from the National Guard, Kenneth McIntosh is with us. It's part of a nice program Mike Dunn has done with you guys at the Little Project. It's called One for All, All and Done for All, All for One. Yes. Tell me right. about the, the program. It's a, the program is going to be called uh, All for One and Done for All. Basically, what we're doing is uh, we teamed up with Mike Dunn from the Miami Marlins, and he has uh, been kind enough to take out um, about 10 tickets each game for veterans and their families to come out and enjoy the Marlins games, give them something yeah. to break up the monotony of everyday uh, life. Now you guys got a chance to get on the field before the game and uh, schmooze a little bit. Uh, I know the seats and the food vouchers is really a nice program for everyone, huh? It, um, my stepdaughter was sitting next to Mike Dunn and uh, was trying to get autographs and probably his phone number. But um, all, all in all, we enjoyed being out there during batting practice. It's something I've never experienced before, and I know some of the other guys haven't as well. Kenneth, have your daughter stand up, and she can show you the great shirt here. Just look out to that camera. Let's see the logo on the front. It says all for one and done for all in the, in the camouflage. And turn around, and you got Mike Dunn's signature with the number 40 there. And you're able to come out with your family, and you haven't been to a game before. What do you think? Great experience. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity that Mike Dunn presented us, and we're happy to be here. Great. Having a good time with all. Tell me about the Little Warrior Project that you have. I founded the Little Warrior Project because I noticed in South Florida we have a very big veterans presence. However, there's not a lot of programs that focus strictly on military children and being in the military for the past 10 years, I wanted to do something that give back to the community, but to a smaller niche of the community that's not really, you know, it's kind of overlooked. Yeah. So I um, decided to start the Little Warrior Project. The logo is a picture of me and my son when he was three years old. Very nice. So Let me ask you one last thing, because we have a lot of people in the military, this is for the military and their families. How would somebody get involved, come out to a game? How does that all work? They just have to go to my website and contact us. You can go to www.littlewarriorproject.org or you can use any of the social media sites forward slash at Facebook, um, Little Warrior Project, and on Twitter, it's at Little Warrior PR. Any of those things can get in contact with us and we'll get 
right back to you within a few hours, uh, the next day at the latest. You're doing a great job. Thanks for your service, gentlemen. Thank and I'm uh, glad that Mike Dunn was able to hook up with you. All for one and done for all, guys. And we're done right now. Back to you. That's a good story. Mike Dunn having a, a nice year. The Mets have a 2-1 lead. Juan Pierre and Donovan Solano retired. Giancarlo Stanton now. Fastball. And you see John Buck react because he heard it hit the mask of Tim McClellan. Stanton, his third at bat, he has struck out, bounced into a double play, though that did produce a run. And Harvey's still out there. He's at 94 pitches. Harvey's capacity in terms of pitch count certainly more accelerated because of his age and his experience. Ten starts in the big leagues last year. Five starts already this year. And of course, the Marlins are going to be very cautious with Jose Fernandez throughout this season. This Joe Espada wanting to make sure he's as far away as he can get. Joe's near South Beach, positioning himself down there. Two and one. Stanton three homers his last two games, and he. Swings and misses at a sharp slider. Got that hard slider. The one thing we've seen in Harvey tonight, we've seen everything that he has to offer. There's a pitch a couple of weeks ago, Stanton would have chased. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets that same pitch again. He either goes there again or he goes up. See if he can get him to chase that fastball. Fastball in and he popped it up. Towards the dugout. Buck is there and he makes the play. And Harvey has retired in Stanton all three times. And the Mets are hanging on to a 2-1 lead behind their right-hander out of Connecticut. Harvey Jose Fernandez matchup didn't quite uh, turn out like many people expected. A low scoring game, and that ball down the left field line is going to be foul. Heck of a catch. He and his buddy brought the glove, made the play, and was positioned just right. See, that's with advanced metrics for fans, Tommy. That's what it means. Joe Madden started that revolution 20 years ago when he started traveling with a, a big computer, getting the defensive spreadsheets. 
fans now could just go to fan graphs or wherever get the, the layout. Here's the one one Lucas Duda. And it's away. So it's two one so on the surface you say well yeah it is a pitcher's duel. But Fernandez Landis lasted just the four innings. Kohler into his second in relief. And he goes up and in and gets a strike on Duda. Well, and you also, Rich, have a couple of teams that have struggled scoring runs. Counts three and two. The Mets left fielder, that's where Duda is tonight. Dobbs is there. First out of the sixth. They're kind of on the same day in rotation. Did you see where the uh, Cincinnati Red lefty that we saw in Cincinnati, Tony Zingrani, had a nice game last night. For the Reds picked up his second win, had 11 strikeouts in six innings to beat the Nationals. John Buck, 439 foot blast. In the fourth inning against Fernandez, his ninth, 25 runs driven in. That was a palm tree blast. Yes, it was. Our Toyota trend, all time RBIs in April. He's one shy of Jeff Kent. It's a solo shot here. He's tied it. Swings and misses at a breaking ball. Buck is tied now with Bryce Harper. And they're three behind Justin Upton. Buck now leads the National League in RBIs. Because Brandon Phillips does not have one this, uh, this game so far. Off the end of the bat, Stanton charges in. He makes the catch. Reds and the Cardinals, good pitching matchup in that game. Latos and Wainwright. Wainwright has a, a tie to this game, and that the run support has been tough for any Marlin pitcher, Fernandez included. Not so much for Harvey. Harvey has the third best run support in the National League. Lance Lynn and Adam Wainwright. Are one and two. They're getting the most runs of yeah, both with the Cardinals, too. Yeah. Go figure. So there has to be one starter on the Cardinals that's getting the short end of things. <laughs> He's getting the Kevin Slowey treatment. <laughs> Puller misses away. Mets still have just the three hits. The Turner and Tejada singles in the first two innings and the Buck two run homer from the fourth. Well, that's a pretty good pitch from Kohler. Very valuable and uh, could have gone the other way could have gone the way of a strike. But very valuable is uh, Tom Kohler what he can do. And coming into a game like this and he's he's kept it a, a one run game. By making good pitches. For the most part, the Marlins bullpen has been pretty good this year. The guy that struggled the most has been Steve Ciszek. Dodgers and Rockies tonight in Los Angeles. Hanley Ramirez is off the disabled list tonight. Yeah, I was going to say when we were talking about. Uh, Clayton Kershaw that the Marlins could see Hanley and looks like they will. Chooch ready to go too. He came off the uh, suspended list last night. Carlos Ruiz for the Phillies. 
I think the Phillies have missed him. He is uh, a guy that's always terrific with runners in scoring position. I know that many argue that that's a stat that's overblown and often accidental. But when you look at a guy like Ruiz, who has done it so well in his career, I, I don't think you can, in his case, say that it's any accident. And nothing against Eric Kratz. He's a good backup guy, which he'll, he'll be now. 3 2 coming. Oof. Oh, strike three call. That's the three second delay as Tim McClellan starts the lawnmower and pumps out Ike Davis. Count one, count two, got him. Mardi Gras Casino scoreboard. We told you about the Nationals and the Braves all tied up. Milwaukee has a 5-2 lead over Pittsburgh. Giants in Arizona getting ready to start, as well as the Rockies and the Dodgers. Padres are in Chicago, and the Cubs have a 2-1 lead. Tommy talked about that pitching matchup in St. Louis with the Reds up 1-0. That's the Mardi Gras Casino scoreboard. Now, the Rockies might be, just for a couple of days from what I read, might be without... Troy Tulowitzki. They're also a shortstop. Injured his left shoulder in a ball game yesterday. Head first slide. Well, Matt Harvey is still out there, and Harvey gets Placido Polanco, Greg Dobbs, Justin Ruggiano in the sixth. Third time through for these hitters. Harvey still having trouble locating that fastball. You know what? Uh, he has really shown. Everyone, the scouts, he's shown me something because clearly he hasn't had the command. He hasn't had his best stuff. But he has seven strikeouts. He's walked just one. He's given up just one run. And here he is still pitching in the sixth inning. It'll probably be his last inning. Polanco has bounced out twice. If he leaves this game. Allowing just the one run. You go back to his 10 starts last year. This is sixth start this year. It'll be 10 of 16 major league starts. He's given up one run or less. And we noted early in the telecast. He didn't light the world on fire in the minor leagues. In his 32 Double and triple A starts. He was 12 and 8 with an ERA of around 4. So you have to like a guy, and by all accounts, he is an extremely hard worker, good guy. Mets couldn't be happier with him, aside from his uh, pitching abilities. He doesn't seem to have really been caught up in any hoopla, and that's that's easy to do when you're pitching in New York.
Tejada goes and gets a good hop and throws out Polanco. Tomorrow night, it's the Marlins and the Mets. You go to the Tuesday edition of the Miami Herald. Take advantage of the half-price Tuesday offer. Get up to eight half-price tickets in the Legend Silver, Baseline Reserve, Bullpen Reserve, or Home Run Porch. Visit the Marlins Park ticket office or go to marlins.com. Dobbs doubled back in the fourth. That was a great opportunity for Miami. Dobbs led off the fourth with a scorching liner to the base of the wall in right center. But the Marlins couldn't move him and thus couldn't score him because Harvey struck out Ruggiano on a slider, Brantley on a changeup. That's been one of those reoccurring themes that Mike Redmond would like to get out of. That leadoff double, or man at second base with nobody out, and he's still there when the inning ends. Now we would really tax our crack staff if we were to ask them: Is there anybody in baseball that has more leadoff doubles that have not led to runs, percentage-wise, than Miami? Because as you point out, it seems like the Marlins at one point had what nine or ten leadoff doubles that had not led to runs. Yeah, I think at one point it was either leadoff doubles or a man at second with nobody out. It could be first and second. I believe at one point they were 0 for 10 in getting that runner in. That's unofficial crack staff uh, information. Is there some sort of seal of approval process that is involved? Three and one to Dobb. Now similar count here for Dobbs. Remember he got himself in a fastball count and absolutely walloped one his last at bat. Mets bullpen is warm and ready. And he got a fastball but it was a a runner on the outside part. We were talking about the bullpens of both of these teams, the, the three worst bullpens in the league, the Mets, the Cardinals, and the Marlins. Hard to imagine the Cardinals have the worst bullpen in the National League. And right now the Cardinals are just a half game behind Pittsburgh. And the Cardinals had the best ERA in the National League at 3.29. A lot of that coming from their starting pitching. Certainly their offense has done a nice job. You know the Padres have the highest ERA in the National League, 4.39. The Marlins are 14th in the National League. And Dobbs walks, and so Harvey. Now at 113 pitches, Dobbs is aboard for the second time tonight. This is a guy that Harvey has handled, though, in Ruggiano, and it's been the slider that has been his out pitch against Miami's center fielder. So a career high in pitches for Harvey. And again, off speed, Ruggiano, a check swing and a strike, it's 0 1. Well, you, you look at Matt Harvey and you certainly say for the Mets' future, he is one of those guys who is going to be your ace, your horse, who's uh, going to give you innings and quality innings. Ball and a strike. Fastball at the knees.
one and two. Two and two. That's bullpen is ready. You've got the left handed hitting Brantley on deck. Maybe the last guy. Yeah, you, you just have to wonder how how long Terry Collins is going to go with Harvey. You got a lefty and a righty in that Mets bullpen. He's not losing any though. His 115th pitch was 95 miles an hour. Robert Carson is the lefty. Now he hung that breaking ball to Ruggiano. The pitches that Ruggiano has struck out on were sliders just out of the zone. And Buck is set up out for what seems like that same pitch. Well, Harvey came in with a changeup, and he may have crossed Buck up. Buck was set up, Tommy. In the spot where he's been for sliders. And watch the pitch. You would expect you're usually not going to set up out there for a changeup. You're going to set up out there for the slider or the curveball. It's a one run ball game. The Mets living off the John Buck two run homer. Miami got their lone run back in the third. Greg Dobbs at first with one out. 2 2 to Ruggiano. Slider. Pretty good one to hit, though. Had a good swing, just fouled it back. The Mets' young ace battling Ruggiano with a career high 120 pitches. Two two fastball rifled into left field. That's a base hit. Terrific at bat by Ruggiano. And let's see if Terry Collins stays with Harvey or goes and gets the lefty Carson. And he's going to get the lefty. Just the three hitters in this inning. Harvey threw 22 pitches. Finally got one up and a good battle. Good at bat by Ruggiano, who fouled off some, some good pitches. And then hung in there and got himself a base hit. So Miami has runners first and second, and they've chased Harvey. In comes the lefty Carson. 2 1 Mets. Young catcher is up. And out of the Mets bullpen, 
Robert Carson appearing in just his third game. Pretty much a uh, sinker slider guy. Used uh, in most situations against lefties. Carson was having a terrific year at the Mets AAA affiliate, which this year is Las Vegas. Eight appearances and a 1.17 ERA with the uh, Las Vegas 51s. Been a, a struggle for Rob. Just two for 19 this year against lefties. Breaking ball in the air. Coming on is Lucas Duda. And he makes the catch. So Carson gets Brantley. Now you've got Green and Terry Collins is coming out, and Carson was in for just the one hitter. So Terry Collins making sure that all of you that are following along have plenty of time to get up, get something to eat, refresh that uh, beverage. Lots of time. Still 2 1, Mets. Bottom six. Scott Atchison is in. And Atchison arrives with Nick Green at the plate and runners at first and second. Tom Kohler is on deck. If you've been with us all night, you know the Marlins are working with a short bench. They had Jose Fernandez hit in a key spot in the fourth and didn't want to burn a pinch hitter there. Atchison misses up. There's action in the Marlins pen. So who knows whether Joe Espada had another talk with Nick Green here about what Mike Redmond's going to do if well, he if reaches. It, if it gets to the pitcher spot here, we'll see Chris Cogman, left handed bat. Green fouls it off, counts one and one. There's Kohler's put in. A couple scoreless innings. Green to center. Valdespin has plenty of room. And he makes the catch. And Miami leads a couple here in the sixth. On to the seventh. It is still 2 1, New York.
John Buck two-run homer is the difference in the ball game, and it came off of Jose Fernandez in a matchup of Matt Harvey and Jose Fernandez. Both are long gone. Buenos cerrados juegos, huh? And we're joined now. Hay duda de que nuestro picheo se ha aguantado la posición bastante para uh, mantenerse siempre en todo, todos los partidos. Vamos Hi, everybody. It's Raul and Cookie. Hi, guys. Hey, hey what's how up, Jeremy? Richie? How are you? Tommy, how are you? We're, we're good. Always good to talk to you guys. Same, you know, it's here. two... Good young pitchers. It hasn't turned out to be a pitcher's duel, but it's turned out to be a close game, hasn't it? Well, we, we're seeing two good pitchers. I mean, there's no question with five good tools and good fastballs and breaking balls and changeups. And I don't think that Harvey was that sharp uh, tonight. You know, he kept everybody off, off balance a little bit, but we still got seven hits off of him. And then Fernandez only allowed three. One that was Cotley, the one to John Bach that, for that home run. I thought it was interesting, guys, because if you looked at the first, uh, if you look at the first few innings, um, even though the numbers were pretty similar, it just seemed like Harvey was having an easier way through the lineup. Yeah, both pitchers struggled with their uh, fastball, with the command of their fastball, and started to use the slider, the changeup, and other pitches. Did you think that, especially early on, that McClellan was maybe squeezing the zone a little bit? You know, I think he generally has a small strike zone. I think he's consistent with it. I think Jose Fernandez, his fastball, he's rushing so much at home play. Everything is high on that fastball and getting behind on the hitters. And in the last couple of outings, that's what he has shown, you know. We had to see both young starters rely on their secondary stuff tonight. Now, Cookie, we've had a chance to see John Buck. Now this is for the, the second time. What do you see differently in Buck, who obviously is enjoying a terrific year and in stark contrast to his struggles of last season? It seems to me that he's more patient at the plate and swinging a good pitch and getting ahead on the count. You know, it's like here, the fastball that he got was right down in the knees. You know, that's what, he's, that's what his zone is for his power. And he started very well this year. He got eight and nine home runs already in the second in the league in RBIs. He seems like he's a lot happier. I mean, uh, no question about it that sometimes a change makes a big difference in a ball player, and it sure has in uh, John Bach. Breaking ball from Kohler is a strike to Jordani Baldispi. All right, guys. Have a good night. All right, you, you too, too, guys. Have a good one. Keep him close. I think, I think also, Rich, as we saw that shot at John Buck, it's the manicure that's uh, helped out. He's got those neon nails going <laughs> right now. Got the neon nails so that his pitcher can see which fingers he puts down. Yeah, only on the right hand. Does he go to Hugo the barber for that? See, there you go. It's a little neon tape. It's a little tape. Not the neon trees, but neon tape. Bradley flat ran right by that one. And with Valdez being speed, it's going to be a base hit. I think a little over aggressiveness and not realizing that that ball had some backspin on it and it hits the dirt and doesn't bounce out toward the grass where Brantley thought it would. And Valdespin has good speed, so he was going to have to pick that ball and make a good throw to get him. But a little chopper infield hit for Valdespin. Marlon Bird. Well traveled veteran, 35 year old, off of his 50 game suspension last year, violating Major League Baseball's performance enhancing drug policy. And Kohler's fastball is up and in. And Miami's asking Kohler to go three innings here. He's gone two scoreless. Kohler. A starter. Oof. That's not fun. Going and gets off the, uh, the glove of Brantley, advancing Valdespin to second base. Chuck Hernandez is out to check on Kohler. You know, Kohler has been a starter throughout his uh, minor league career. As a Marlin, he's been asked to fill a variety of roles here in the bullpen. Right 
right now he's at 40 pitches. Kohler's career ERA as a reliever is just under three and a half. Well, he's a guy that actually has filled that role quite nicely at the big league level. Bird waits and gets a strike. He's just a nice piece to have down there because you can use him in this situation and who knows down the road in, in an emergency you, you can always start him in a game. Two one coming. Kohler battles back. Speaking of guys that have uh, been around the Troy Hawkins has had a long major league career. Making sure the hat has enough hydration. Two two. And it stays at two and two. Well, the Houston Astros are whooping the Yankees nine to one in the eighth. Our guy Jose Altuve. Has a couple hits, including a double. Catcher Carlos Coporan. He's having a big night. Yes. Four hits, four RBIs. Swing and a miss. Good fastball. Kohler strikes out Bird. Tom Kohler with his fourth strikeout since coming into the fifth inning. Blew that fastball by Marlon Bird. We talk about that Houston game. That's one of those games. If you looked in the paper, even though the Yankees are banged up, their lineup still has a number of veterans in it. Had Andy Pettit on the mound. You had the Astros coming into that game with a seven and eighteen record. And baseball being the way it is, they have a nine to one lead. Baxter now and he takes up Mike Baxter who had that heroic catch in the Johan Santana no hitter last year a catch which actually cost him some playing time he injured his back went on the disabled list Queens native sprays that ground ball foul. Speaking of Johan Santana in our conversation with Mike Redmond before the game when we we pointed out how Jose Fernandez had been working on on tipping some pitches little subtle things he said you know what the bottom line guys still have to hit the ball and get base hits and he said Johan Santana tipped his change up all the time and guys still couldn't hit. Kohler misses up and it's two and one. If the Marlins could get three scoreless out of Kohler, they'll certainly take that. Fernandez lasted just four. Two balls, two strikes. Marlins and Mets tomorrow night and then on Wednesday afternoon and then it's four in Philly four days of cheesesteaks. Can we survive. I mean it's a great food trip. Then it's on to fish tacos. 
And then in and out burger in L.A. Here's the 2 2. And he uh, got good him. job by Tom Kohler. Tom Kohler, three scoreless innings, and he keeps the game right at 2 1. He ties a career high with five strikeouts. Mets lead Miami 2 1. The scoreboard first, uh, base hit up the middle off the bat of J.P. Lampierre. He moved over to third base on that base hit from Donovan Solano. Giancarlo got a pitch up, hit it hard, but it was a double play ball. No RBI for Stanton, but the Marlins got on the scoreboard and had a 1-0 lead. That lead was erased quickly and with a home run over 440 feet after the walk to Lucas due to John Buck with his ninth home run, two RBIs. He leads the National League in the RBI department and put a dent in the home run sculpture. And that's been the scoring. It's two to one. Now the Mets go to the veteran, LaTroy Hawkins. And all of that brought to you by Auto Nation. LaTroy Hawkins enters. And Austin Kearns appears. Kearns pinch hitting to lead off the seventh. Juan Pierre Donovan Solano to follow. Hawkins gets a strike at the knees. Got your choice of a, a couple of pinch hitters. You know you're going to to use another one, at least one more. And the the Mets, if it gets to a closing situation, their closer is a right-hander, Bobby Parnell. Kearns trying to leg this one out, and he does. Austin Kearns, when he crossed the finish line, he ripped the helmet off. And an infield hit for Kearns. That's the one thing Austin Kearns can do and can give you. He, he gives you a decent at bat. He's walked a few times as a pinch hitter. He's three for nine now coming off the bench in the pinch. Now Pierre. Boy, well, Troy Hawkins has been a professional baseball player since 1991. When he arrived in spring training with the Twins. Spent last year with the Angels, made 48 appearances, had a nice year, a, an ERA in the mid threes in 2011, a very nice year with the Brewers, a, an ERA of 2.42. Had some good years in Houston. Longtime twin, Cub, Giant, got Oriole. Any, got a chance to uh, get to a thousand games this year. Been to the postseason four times. Twice with Minnesota, with Colorado, and with Milwaukee. 
Hard bunt and a throw to second. No one's there. And a nice play by Tejada to make the catch and get the tag. The Mets infield rotation was a little jumbled up, but it worked out for him. Turner made a perfect feed to Tejada on a skinny post. Well, you can see exactly what Juan Pierre was trying to do. They were coming in so closely, he was trying to slap the ball by. Great effort by the Mets in the infield. Turner throws to the bag, and it's cut off by Tejada, and he's able to put the tag on Kearns. You don't see that play too often, but they pulled it off. And so Pierre unable to move the runner with the bunt. Solano and Stanton now. And Pierre's at first. In a 2 1 game in the bottom of the seventh, the Mets and the Marlins opening up a three game series. Silver lining in that play, at least the, the Marlins exchange speed. They get speed with Juan Pierre out there as opposed to Austin Kearns. Pierre bluffs. And a strike from Hawkins. Solano looking down the line too. Now as a hitter, you see that runner start. Oftentimes you Go into shutdown mode. Yeah, especially early in the count, you maybe think, okay, he's going to take off. I'll take the pitch and let him steal. Third pitcher out of the Mets bullpen, fourth to work. Matt Harvey five and a third innings and Harvey is in line for his fifth win. Solano slow grounder Hawkins has it gets it out the relay is in time and the Mets infield turns a double play Ruben Tejada had a hand in every out. And the Marlins seventh goes nowhere. Coming up Thursday the 2nd at Duffy Sports Grill. 
at the Intercoastal Mall in North Miami Beach. Marlins and Phillies, 705. Prizes, Philly, Energy Team. Wear your Marlins gear like that hat. And get your first drink free at Duffy Sports Group. Go to Marlins.com for more info. AJ Ramos, he'll try to duplicate what Tom Kohler was able to do. Kohler put in three scoreless innings, gave up just one hit, struck out a career high five, walked one, and now it's Ramos against the Mets in the eighth. You know, the Marlins have already this year had nine games in which they've scored one run or less. And that's. That's why it's been frustrating because there have been so many close games. That's why in our AT&T U-verse poll, I, I sided with the, you know, the question was, had the Marlins offense turned the corner? And, and my, I went with the uh, hashtag no. I, I kind of went with they got the turn sig signal on. They haven't made the turn yet. How's that? I'll give you that, but I, I think they they need to get closer to that intersection before they can approach uh, turning the corner. And and maybe it's not until June. Maybe it's not until Logan Morrison's healthy. Maybe it's not until maybe an Ozuna or a Yelich stays up, gets on fire, stays on fire, and gets up here. Let's check in with Craig Minervini. Craig. Well, guys, the, the numbers have been, it's progress. I think we'd all agree that. Maybe not as much as you'd like to see, but the Marlins have doubled their uh, run production in the last 12 games coming into this one. Even here, where the pitcher's allowing a 170 average. Let's take that one. Stanton will try to take it, and he just as it go off of his glove, and racing into second is Justin Turner with a leadoff double in the eighth. Go back to it, Craig. Go ahead. Yeah, so the, the production has been better in this game, for example, you know, pitchers giving up an average of about 173, 174. The Marlins were able to get seven hits. Unfortunately, though, the runners in scoring position problem was a bugaboo here. But we talk about better. This is what you're talking about. Numbers on the right. Won a few more games. Doubling your run production. Average a little better. Slugging up on base percentage. And the big one there in the bottom that I talked with Tino Martinez about is grounding into double plays. Now, in this game, as it turned out, although they were both sharply hit, the Marlins have grounded into two more double plays what Tino was saying and he said he told his team you're just being over aggressive early in the season and that they're taking advantage of it swing at good pitches he said it's killing me because normally I don't worry about four at bats now I got to worry about 27 outs he said but I love helping and teaching them the problem has been with runners in scoring position and that hasn't improved in a big way yet for the Marlins yeah the life of a, a big league hitting instructor on a struggling offensive team good stuff Craig Daniel Murphy. Well, that was a, a tough play for John Carlos Stan. This is how close he came. Just over his glove. Yeah, that ball was stung by Turner. Now the Mets are going to try to get Turner over, get him in. Murphy, Duda, and Buck against Ramos. And the 1 1 pitch coming. The hard part and even the numbers that, that Craig just went through even the improved numbers on the right that still is high stress on starters and on relievers in terms of any mistake any runs you let up those could be the runs that decide the ball game. And then it gets to that point as a bullpen with Ramos out there right now knowing what the score is. Knowing how the offense is struggling, putting the pressure on yourself maybe too much, saying, "Boy, you just cannot allow another run." Well, that's a nice scuffed-up ball. That's a good one for a pitcher to throw. Pierre, runner tags. Turner may test the arm, but Pierre had a good angle. Turner saw it and he stopped. Bring on the red car, and we'll introduce tomorrow night's starters. Jeremy Hefner, 
Marlins will see him for the second time. Kevin Slowey. The ERA for Slowey, 2.43. That's tomorrow night, 6.30 for Marlins Live. 7 o'clock, game time. Ties straight. Coats button. And then remember on Wednesday, it's a 12.40 first pitch, 12 o'clock Marlins Live. Lucas Duda takes down low for Ramos. Ryan Webb getting ready, getting warm. Big hop up. Solano gets the out. Turner arrives at third, but it's with two outs now. And Ramos will go after John Buck. And of course, Buck, the difference of the game. That two strike, two run homer in the fourth against Jose Fernandez. Just thinking when I saw Buck in the on deck circle, the number certainly isn't the problem. Remember, it was. Jason Bay, who was number 44 with the Mets the last couple of years, and certainly had his struggles. Jason Bay hitting 229 in Seattle this year, where he used to make his off-season home and now makes his in-season home there as well. They grew up. North of the border up in uh, British Columbia. Buck ready for a 1 0 pitch. Could rip the breaking ball. Brandon Lyon in New York's bullpen. The Mets have a, a one run lead, but tonight they're 0 for 9. With runners in scoring position. Wow. That one got away from everybody. Buck certainly wasn't looking for that. Nor was Brantley. Nor was Tim McClellan. Boy, a tough one for Brantley to get up and catch, too. Counts two and one, and of course with Turner at third base, if it does get by Brantley, it's probably a three-one game. And Ramos, he does not seem eager to pitch to Buck. You've got Ike Davis, a lefty on deck. It's a strike with a breaking ball. Nice uh, 3 1 pitch. Certainly not what Buck was expecting. Breaking ball hammered and caught. Polanco right there. And Ramos is bailed out. Still, the Mets in Miami with a 2 1 lead.
Or three innings worth. Ramos, an inning worth. And in relief of Jose Fernandez coming up. Marlins live. They'll light the spaceship out there in center. Craig Mintervini, Jeff Konach, brought to you by Checkers. Joe Espada mic'd up. It's the uh, full-length version, the uncensored version. Here in the game, we have to be careful. But on well, the post-game, it, it, they let it rip. It's cable. It's late night. It's you know. A little more relaxed. It's Craig. It's Niner. Giancarlo Stanton, Placido Polanco, Greg Dobbs, and another Met reliever is on. Brandon Lyon. Been kind of an interesting scenario for the uh, Mets bullpen between Carson, Atchison, and Hawkins. They've gone an inning and two thirds. They turn it over to Lyon now, but in an inning and two thirds, they only threw 11 pitches. Stanton swings and misses. Yeah, Carson and Atchison both just a third of it. I mean, Hawkins got that double play ball in the seventh. Of course, Harvey is lined up for the win. 0 2. And Stanton whiffs on a breaking ball. That's what Stanton was doing earlier. We haven't seen that in the last few games, about the last week. But Lyon kept away with sliders and just kept going further away and got him to chase him. Three strikeouts, 0 for 4 is Stanton tonight. Polanco is 0 for 3. Miami has eight hits. The Mets have five, but the Mets have the biggest one, and that's the two-run homer by Buck. Oh, well, the Braves have finished off the Nationals 3 to 2. Craig Kimbrell. Saving that ball game. There's a surprise. Davis is there and he steps on the bag. Get a surprise for you. Did you see who leads the league in saves, though? The National League leader in saves with 10. I'm not sure what number that was for Kimbrell. But leading with 10 saves going into play tonight. Jason Grilly, the Pirates. That Tommy Hutton is a good number, a good stat for Kimbrel in his ninth. For Dobbs, he is fourth time to the plate. Struck out, doubled, walked. Knocks one up into the seats. Remember when the Marlins were in New York, they had opened the season in Washington and were swept by the Nationals, but won the first game of that series in New York. Lost the second. And then in the Fernandez start on the Sunday, Fernandez left with a 3 1 lead. The bullpen couldn't hold it. Dobbs sends that out to left. Duda squeezes and it's on to the ninth. Brandon Lyon, a scoreless eight.
Series, and the Mets lead it 2-1. The matchup of Matt Harvey and Jose Fernandez. John Buck's two-run homer against Fernandez erased a 1-0 Miami lead. The Mets are 0 for 10 with runners in scoring position. Both bullpens have been really good. And so that's where these two teams sit going into the ninth inning. Ryan Webb has had a, a real nice year so far. He's already appeared in nine games and his workload at 13 and a third innings. You see the ERA at under three. So Webb will bring his uh, variety of two seamers and cutters and sinkers. Yeah, opposing batters hitting just 167 against Ryan Webb, who I think always has a little special place in his heart when he pitches against the uh, Mets. His uh, dad, Hank, pitched for the Mets in the 70s. He had a nice season in 1975 for the for the Mets with seven and six and 29 games, 15 starts. Mike Davis climbs in. Ruben Tejada, Jordani Valdespi, also scheduled to appear here in the night. And Webb misses away. The Mets came into this series having lost five of six, four in a row, swept by the Phillies, dropped two of three to the Dodgers. Were it not for the Valdespin Grand Slam to win one of those games, they would have been swept by the Dodgers as well. Is Roush getting ready? Ground ball, and it's kicked by Solano. And that will be an error on Miami's second baseman. The normally sure handed Donovan Solano. Solano's fourth error of the season. He tries to come and get it before it gets that short hop, and he couldn't get there in time. And he had plenty of time because, as you pointed out, Ike Davis, not the fleetest of foot. Here now is Tejada. He runs up to bunt and it's a strike. He went after it. Tejada looking into the Mets dugout. Now looking down to Tim Tuffle, third base coach. Part of that 86 Met World Championship team. Good bunt. Dobbs gets the out. Mets move the runner up. Valdez being and then a pinch hitter. See David Wright in the dugout. Wright not in the lineup tonight with a stiff neck. What a boost that would be for the Mets to. Win this ball game without right. Who's one of obviously their main offensive weapon outside of John Buck. Buck hitting his ninth home run of the season tonight, and it's not even May yet. Mm. Yeah, the Mets after this three game series here. Fly into Atlanta have Thursday off and then have a weekend series against the Braves. Colin Cowgill is on deck. Yeah, in essence, if if right in fact is not available then Terry Collins kind of working with the same deal that Mike Redmond is a little bit of a short bench. 
Bobby Parnell waiting for a save opportunity. There's one out. Brian Webb in the ninth. Foul that's being called timeout. Brantley trots out to center. Trots out to the mound. That'd be an interesting story if he trotted, trotted out, out to center. center. Trotted out to center, yeah. And we still have to ask Jim Joyce the other day in the ball game. He trotted out to left field. And I failed to ask him when we yesterday powwowed with the umpires because we were so focused on the strike zone. On oh, the strike zone, yeah. So here is the 1 1 pitch. Little tapper. Webb fires the first in time. Now the speeds out. Mets end up with Ike Davis at third and two outs. Cowgill coming to the plate as a pinch hitter, the 26 year old University of Kentucky product, high energy guy. <laughs> Yeah, very good, uh, very good outfielder. One of those guys, one of those guys they refer to as a grinder. He had a, an opening day grand slam. Mets have hit three grand slams already. First Met to hit a grand slam in his debut. So that's a that's a way to endear yourself to Met fans. Oh one. Webb off the mound sets himself and Tobbs happy to catch that uh, two seamer and hold on to it. Webb a scoreless ninth. Miami needs a run. They're down two one. Jose Fernandez lasted just four, but he's stuck in the dugout. Colin Cowgill is out in center field. Marlins have Justin Ruggiano, Rob Brantley, Nick Green scheduled. And there's Parnell, who, as you pointed out, Tommy, in a bullpen that has the worst ERA in the National League, Parnell has been a bright spot. Yeah, he sure has. Uh, all you have to do is look at his numbers to figure that out. Nine to third, he's given up four hits and a run. Ten strikeouts, just one walk. So here we go. Ruggiano 
climbs in Parnell unfolds and misses away. A one for three night a pair of strikeouts against Matt Harvey singled off Harvey. It was the last man that Harvey faced in the sixth. Ball in a strike. You and I have seen, Marlins have seen, fans have seen Parnell over the years, but this that first opportunity where they said, "Okay, you're the closer this year." Good Parnell. Hard. Good hard moving fastball and a curveball. You see his career numbers. Ruggiano right center. That's well hit. Baxter off the wall it goes. And Ruggiano a leadoff double. The Marlins with yet another leadoff double. And it comes here in the ninth in a one run game. Fastball middle out over the plate. He tries to pull it. Doesn't hit the ball that well and really squirts it into right center. Good play by Cowgill who came into the game in center field to get it back quickly. Speed out there in Ruggiano. He runs the base as well. It's out. No swing. Joe Espada. It's been a 2 1 ball game for some time. Buck's home run was in the fourth. And the bullpens have been untouchable since. One and one. Bobby Parnell trying to save this ball game for New York. The 1 1 to Brantley. Off the end of the bat. Yeah, you, you try to pull positives out of situations, and I think because the Marlins have been involved in so many low scoring close games, this is nothing right here. Trailing by one in the ninth inning, leadoff double. The problem has been for Mike Redmond is getting the hit to tie and then win those close games. One two. Brantley takes away. This was a, a Matt Harvey Jose Fernandez matchup and it didn't quite live up to the billing. Neither had command of the fastball. Harvey went five and a third. He struck out seven gave up one run. Fernandez lasted just four innings gave up two runs both coming on the buck homer. Two two to Brantley. Runner goes and it's fouled off. Ruggiano had a terrific jump, but obviously Brantley at two strikes is in protect mode. Sometimes you get that one shot too, because now everyone in the infield, Parnell included, is going to be aware that get Ruggiano on, could get do off. it. Get off. Hey, even Joe Espada knew he had a good jump. Count still two and two. Parnell and Brantley. Brantley just 23. Just out of the glove of Buck. 
And of course, it was Brantley and Buck that shared the catching duties the last two months of the season once the Marlins made the deal with the Tigers. Buck has gone on to have a, a record setting April, hitting his ninth home run of the season tonight. 2 2 coming. In. Good battle, good patience, and you also notice Parnell's changed his approach. He's uh, taken a couple of looks at Luciano at second base to out of the shortstops, moving in behind him a few times. Nine of the ten appearances for Parnell, he's not given up a run. Fastball, fly ball, shallow center off the end of the bat, and it's falling for a hit. It's botched in center by Calgill, but Ruggiano had to make sure it fell before he started to third. Yeah, and Miami's got runners at the corners. You don't have much of an angle as the runner there to see that ball going out to Calgill. So Ruggiano, with nobody out, he did the right thing. He kind of held his ground. He wanted to see where this ball was going to go. Here he is. And then he comes over, slips a little bit, but never had a chance to score. So he did the right thing. Now it's first and third, and nobody out. Randley gets a hit on a flare. Terry Collins watching for a bullpen that has been a mess this year for the Mets. So Ruggiano with a two hit night, Brantley with a two hit night. The Marlins have 10 hits and just the one run. The Mets have five hits and two runs. But the Mets bullpen has been unscored upon tonight. Parnell, though, in trouble here. Green's one for two. And he fouls the pitch off. Coglin is on deck. Parnell has been the best Met reliever this year. Infield bunched for two up the middle. And Green on a high fastball is behind in the count now, 0 and 2. I think you've seen the uh, velocity that Parnell has, 97. He, he's touched 99 in this inning. Joe Espada mic'd up with Ruggiano at third. Nothing on, okay? We're going on the ground anyway, okay? On the ground, we're going to go. Tag open a fly ball. O2, he got a piece. So if the Met infield gets a ball that they just don't think they can turn two on, they'll go home. You, you heard Joe Espada tell Ruggiano he's going on the ground. Ball hit on the ground. Another O2. Breaking ball, fly ball, center field. Should be deep enough to score the run. Ruggiano tags on his way home, and Miami is tied it. Nick Green delivers. Parnell went away from that 98 mile an hour fastball and threw his curveball up there. Here it comes. And Nick Green had a chance to get it deep enough to tie the game. So a good job by Nick Green, a good good at bat to make contact and get the run in. Tag up. Go ahead. That's good stuff tonight with Joe Espada mic'd up. Brantley's at first. Coglin digs in. Coglin, a one hopper. Out there, out there. Miami has tied it, but that's it in the night. And on to the 10th. In Miami tonight, the Mets and the Marlins are at 2 2.
Florida, brought to you by Jack Link's Beef Jerky, the official sponsor of Extra Innings. Who doesn't love Extra Innings? Mets, Marlins, 2-2 in the 10. Even on South Beach, they like Extra Innings. That uh, was Steve Ciszek coming into the game with Marnell blowing the, the save, and the Marlins tying it. That deprives Matt Harvey from going 5-0 and to start the season which would have put him in company with Pedro Martinez and not good only other Mets pitchers to go 5 and 0 to start the year in April MLB.tv is celebrating 11 years join the million of fans that would be millions of fans and subscribe today watch every out of market game live online on your favorite mobile and connected devices in HD quality with MLB.tv premium Visit MLB.tv today. MLB.tv. Baseball everywhere. Top of the order for the Mets. Ciszek is in. It has not been the best of years for Steve to start April. And it's the uh, lefty hitter that's given Ciszek problems this year. You know, another guy that's hitting some home runs that is just off to a great start. Just checking on that the Rockies Dodgers game. Dexter Fowler hit number eight tonight for the Rockies. There's the splits, lefties, righties. Boy, that's a that's a big difference. You, you expect lefties a little bit better, but uh, that's a big difference. It was Luis Valbuena who hit the solo homer against Ciszek on Thursday in the Cubs 4-3 win, and that was a solo shot with two outs in the ninth. Baxter up the middle into center field. The Mets have a leadoff hit against Steve Ciszek. Well, at 320 average for lefties, will go up a little bit more. Boy, after the four innings of Jose Fernandez, Tom Kohler was outstanding. Kohler put three innings in in the books, all scoreless. AJ Ramos was next. Ramos handled the eight. And then Ryan Webb. A scoreless night. Ryan had a good two seamer working for him even threw a couple of good ones over the first. He's been that way all season long. There's the bunt. Turner lays it down and the Mets execute. They've executed a couple of nice sacrifice bunts tonight. Now they'll try to make it pay off. They've got the lefty bats in Murphy and Duda with the buck to follow. Make a good job. I th you could hear him yelling all the way up here. Good job by Greg Dobbs to call off Steve Ciszek on that play. We know he's had some trouble in the past. Ciszek has in fielding and making a throw. So a good job by Dobbs to take charge and field it and make the out. So you saw the splits, the lefties versus righties, and here the Mets have the perfect matchup, at least on paper. See what Murphy's done with runners in scoring position as well. Outstanding. But the Mets tonight in that situation, 0 for 12. Murphy sends that one down the left field line, falls just foul. Murphy in a little bit of a, a spell here. He's 0 for his last 16. Yeah, that's a little out of character for him. He's a good hitter. Better against the lefties this year. Pulls a ground ball. Solano gets a big hop. 
Mets with a runner at third. And they've had this numerous times tonight. Runner at third, two outs. Up comes Duda. Lucas Duda is 0 for 3. Do you walk the lefty and pitch to the guy who leads the league in RBIs? Boy, it's uh, you can certainly be selective with Duda, but I don't think you flat out. No, they do. They're going to intentionally walk. They're going to walk him. It's another area that Cishek has to be careful in. This intentional walk. Well, you go back to Seattle. Was it two years ago? A couple of years ago, yeah. Where the game ended on an intentional walk in which Cishek airmailed a, a pitch. It was an intentional walk walk on. The first of its kind. And so it's Buck. And he'll get C Sheck. And he knows it. He caught it last year. So here comes Buck, and he's done the damage tonight. The two run homer in the fourth. And the Marlins are going to pitch to. The National League leader in RBIs. He's had a good year with runners in scoring position. Brantley out to talk to Cishek. Duda at first. Baxter at third. And you know the other thing to be aware of here is any ball in the dirt, anything that gets by Brantley, you know, the Mets would in all likelihood get that run. You've got Baxter who runs well at third base. Check gets a strike. Barely. Saw Buck shake his head to Tim McClellan. And he was right. Ball and a strike. Tenth inning, 2-2. Two -two. Mike Baxter, Lucas Duda. Cishek pours across a fastball for a strike. 94 miles an hour. The Marlins have played a couple of other extra inning games. They lost three to one of the Phillies in 10 innings, three to two. In Cincinnati, 13 innings. Breaking ball out. Two and two. Buck waits. See Shet. Got him. Slider. And he struck him out. So see Shet strands a pair. And Miami has a chance to win it in the bottom of the tenth. John Carlos Stanton coming up. A 2 2 game in X ray.
Jose Fernandez talking about this 2 2 slider. And it was a nasty one. It was in a perfect spot. And John Buck couldn't resist. He also couldn't hit it. Love to see the young players, young guys like that, C Shack and Fernandez in there interacting, talking about the game, talking about the pitch. It's one of the most impressive things about Fernandez is he is so into the ball games. He'll leave a start and he'll stay in the dugout and he's up. He's talking to hitters. He's talking to pitchers. Oh, and one to one Pierre Donovan Solano Giancarlo Stanton top of the order against Bobby Parnell who runs that one in to JP. That pitch back. And Harvey went 121 pitches. Only two other pitchers have thrown, actually, three other pitchers have thrown more pitches in a game this year Justin Verlander, Cliff Lee, and Bud North. And I bet all those uh, you mentioned went. Longer than five and a third. <laughs> that was the odd thing about <laughs> tonight is the the headliners were Fernandez and Harvey. And while it was fun to watch both of them pitch, neither had fastball command. That hip here and that hurt here. He does not wear obviously one of those big apparatus pads on that elbow. And Pierre's in a great deal of pain trying to get some life into that right arm. Boy, there aren't a whole lot of guys available. Chris Coughlin has pinch hit. Mahoney's not available. Kearns has pinch hit. You got Miguel Olivo. Boy, right above that elbow. I would think if, if Pierre, even if his elbow is injured to the point where he can't. Hit or play defense, I would think Pierre is tough enough to stay in there and run. And Mike Redmond may be saying something to that effect. We'll we'll do the X-rays after, but to score the winning run, and that'd really help. And, and JP knows that. The Mets are, are trying to coax a, uh, an extra inning out of their closer. Look, look at the knot already. Ugh. Oh, wow. There, here's a scenario, too, now. You, you, you can't bunt Solano. If you bunt Solano, they won't pitch the stand. Oh, look at that. That's a tough man. There are some guys that would just bail out of the game at, at this point. Solano. And Pierre diving back. That can't feel good either. Look at that. I mean, he's diving back. And you can see the pain. I mean, that's how he slides. You see the gloves in his hand. He is a head first slider. Right arm, the right elbow that he, he leads with to go back to the bag, the one that was hit. Yeah, every time that tag comes down from Mike Davis, it's in that vicinity. Well, the Marlins are bunting with Solano. Who fouls it off. Now Joe Espada is walking towards Solano. Make sure everyone's on the same page here.
the airway from first. Parnell to the plate. It's a pitch out. Ball and a strike. And again, even if he's successful, and Donovan Solano drops down a nice bunt, none of us will get to see Stanton swing the bat. And Solano unable to bunt, and now he's stuck at one and two. On a 96 mile an hour fastball from Parnell. And again, it's been an area that's been a struggle. We've seen the Mets drop down a couple sacrifice bunts tonight. I doubt he'll be bunting with the count one and two. Pierre not running. Solano lines it down the right field line, but it's foul. And so the count still at one and two. Two two ball game. Mets, Marlins, lots of uh, wheels turning in both dugouts. Neither manager has a full bench. David Wright out with a sore neck for the Mets. Joe Mahoney with a hamstring issue for Miami. Both bullpens have been terrific. Live when we get there. No spot has been entertaining all night. It's brought to you by Checkers. The great thing about Joey, he's been entertaining in English and Spanish. Solano, slow ground ball. Turner got one. Not in time at first. Solano beats the throw on the Murphy turn. But the Mets get that lead out, and here comes Stanton. Well, the good news is that Stanton should see something to hit anyway. With the Mets not able to turn this double play. Feed wasn't a perfect throw to, to Murphy. And Mike Davis trying to cheat a little bit. Sometimes you, you get that call, but it was it was beaten. The throw was beaten by Solano anyway. So the hard throwing Parnell against one of the strongest men in baseball, Giancarlo Stanton. Who homered twice yesterday. Homered on Saturday night. Takes up. Breaking ball, little dribbler. Buck goes to first, and Stanton is hurt. Down oh goes Stanton. My. Oh, goodness. In a season that has certainly gotten off to an awful start, the sight of Stanton collapsing after he goes across the bag at first just heaps even more. You could see him about two thirds up the line. He was going hard to try to beat that little tapper in front of the plate. Kotchman with a hamstring. Mahoney with a hamstring. And Stent grabbing the back of that leg. Watch him about two thirds of the way up. Stanton finally finds his groove over this past week. The home runs start to come, and down he goes. Wow. And now, Mike Redman has to figure out if, if his team doesn't score here, win this game, he has to figure out a, an outfield alignment. Well, he could put a Levo at first and move Dobbs into the outfield. That may be the likeliest scenario. He's got Chris Valeka too. And he's got 
Juan Pierre with a not the big the size of a baseball over there. They've got a compression sleeve on the elbow for Pierre. Obviously it looks like Stanton can't continue. There's a question as to whether Pierre can continue. So the, the, the way to solve it right now is for Polanco to get a base hit and drive in Solano. That would be welcomed by all. Polanco takes a strike and it's one and one. Seven times he's ended it. But it's been a while. 2008. Parnell still throwing hard, 98. Two and one to Polanco. Solano a good lead at second. And it's up and it's out. Now you're looking at a closer, Tommy. Who has thrown 34 pitches? Yeah, and working here in his second inning. And that's a uh, closers are creatures of routine and habit, and rarely get up into the 30s as far as pitch counts go. Liner to right. Baxter is there, and he makes the catch. And so the Marlins and the Mets head to the 11. Beef jerky. Jack Links, the official sponsor of Extra Innings. 2 2 11. All right, some questions are answered. Juan Pierre is good enough to stay in, not Giancarlo Stanton. So Chris Valeca comes in at first base and out in Stanton's spot in right field. Greg Dobbs moves out. Bronze will make a pitching change as well. And just in looking at, at the Marlins lineup car, that Change brings Chad Qualls into the game. You assume that Qualls would go into Stanton's spot, and Baleka would be in the uh, the number nine spot. Crackstaff giving us a nod, saying that is correct. For the Marlins, it's a 2-2 ball game, but Giancarlo Stanton going down with uh, what. Appeared to be a, a leg injury. He grabbed his hamstring. And Chad Qualls into the ball game. I 
Mike Davis, Ruben Tejada, and Jordani Valdespi. So Mets and Marlins play on. A lot of the uh, National League and American League games on the East Coast have finished. Braves one run better than the Nationals. Braves are at 16 and 9 now. And they've owned the Nationals this year. 3-2 Atlanta wins that game. There's Jerry's Familia. Tigers 4-3 over the Twins. Don't know if Miggy hit any homers in the rain. Uh, Prince Fielder homered his sixth. Andy Dirks homered in that game as well. Detroit's 14 and 10. The Twins 511 and 11. I told you Houston wiped out the Yankees 9 to 1. The Rockies have heaped four runs on the Dodgers early in the third at Chavez Ravine. Dexter Fowler's eighth. Willine Rosario is having a fine year. He's got seven. You know, the Tigers are like the Heat. If Cabrera doesn't do it, it's Prince Field. If Dwayne Wade doesn't do it, it's LeBron. Or maybe Bosch. So they, they have many. Victor Martinez. That's, a, that's as solid of a. 3 4 5 that Danny lineup's going to have. But if they were like the Heat, they would have won the World Series last year against the Giants. <laughs> they, they didn't quite have the pitching that they have this year. Davis strikes out. Qualls gets his first out of the 11th inning. Or, and just perusing baseball. It's gone finally Milwaukee now 10 4. Yikes look at the home runs in that one. Five homers by the Brewers. And a homer by the Pirates 10 4 Milwaukee. Ball jumping out of Miller Park. Giovanni Gallardo hit his second. Gene Segura hit his second. Gomez Aoki Betancourt. Yuneski Betancourt hitting his fifth. Garrett Jones homering for the Pirates. Giovanni Gallardo is three and one with that win. Been a long night for a lot of hitters. Daniel Murphy having an old for Tejada takes a strike. Ruben Tejada has extended his hit streak to six. Cleveland rocks at least tonight in Kansas City. Nine nothing. They shut out the Royals. Check swing. That's a strike. Hey, it's the eleventh inning. If you blink, it's a strike. This is and he blinked and he blinked. Enough. Look at how he tried to get it back though. John Buck has provided the Mets with their two runs, his ninth homer of the season. Out to Solano at second. And Tejada is out of it. And a terrific bullpen work by Miami continues. You had Kohler, he was the, the workhorse out of the pen, three innings. Ramos, Webb, Cishet, Qualls. The amazing thing about it, the, the Marlins came into this game, their bullpen was 28th in the league. Or in baseball, the Mets bullpen was 29th in baseball. But as as we mentioned before, when you have two teams that have also struggled scoring runs, the Mets have lost four in a row. The Mets, five of their last seven games, have scored two or fewer runs. And we've talked about all the games that the Marlins have had this year where they've scored two or fewer runs. Juan Ligaris. So somebody's going to crack that tonight. Off the, the score Mets. side 2 2. Off the Mets bench here. Terry Collins doesn't have a full complement with David Wright. Although the longer this goes, the, maybe the better his neck will feel. Baleka spears the liner. Walls works a perfect 11. 2 2.
University of Southernmost Florida. Real world experience, real life education. 2-2. Two -two. Bottom 11 in Miami tonight. Mets, Marlins opening up a three game series. We've seen just about every Met and just about every Marlin. Please welcome Juris Familia to the broadcast. You were talking last inning, Rich, about the bullpens. The Mets bullpen, four and two thirds innings, giving up three hits in the one run. Marlins bullpen, seven innings of work, three hits, no runs. A couple of walks, seven strikeouts. Rob Brantley waiting patiently. Right fielder Greg Dobbs. Center fielder Justin Ruggiano and then Brantley. Coming up if you've just joined us. Giancarlo Stanton has injured himself. We will pass along word when we get it but it looked to be a, a hamstring injury running up that. First yep. baseline. The best case scenario you would hope. That possibly uh, just a cramp. Because that can happen too. But. Uh, we will get word. Dobbs fouls it back to the screen. Greg Dobbs tonight, a double, a walk. A one for three night. Well, one thing extra innings has allowed the Marlins to do is push their hit total up. Marlins are in double digits with 10 hits, but have just the two runs. Mets, two runs, six hits. Of course, the Buck home run that nearly knocked the uh, Seagull off the home run sculpture. Standing up right now. Cubs lead the Padres five to three. Miami will see the Padres. After a trip to Philly this weekend, a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday series mirroring the days of this one. Up the middle. Picks and a terrific play by Murphy to get Dobbs. Boy, Greg Dobbs looked like he had a base hit. Murphy, certainly not known for his glove, made a great pick and then got airborne and made the throw. Boy, this is a tremendous play. At first, you thought it might go into center field. Murphy with that jump pass type throw. And got something on it. Usually when you have to kind of turn your body completely around that way, you, you don't get a lot on the throw. You got just enough on it to get Dobbs, who thought he might have an infield base hit. Ruggiano, he may have performed that jump pass, Tommy, in honor of another Jacksonville native. Who was playing for New York until the last 24 hours? A certain quarterback. Kind of a sad day for a Gator fans. Uh, he'll be back. Steve Clarkson will straighten him out. It's kind of a play, too, that uh, Derek Jeter has perfected at short. Over the years. 3 and 0. Oh. To Ruggiano. For Jim. a moment I, I thought that was Goose Gossage. <laughs> in the bullpen. I thought it was Mr. Clean. Ruggiano walks on four pitches. Familia. After getting the first out. Puts the winning run on. Now you got Brantley. You also have a guy, aside from Juan Pierre, Ruggiano can pick up stolen base on the year. Ruggiano has three. He's three out of three.
think you'd like to give Brantley the hole though for a couple of shots over at first base. Rajan away from first. Pavilion misses away. How much of that depends on how they work Brantley? A lot. You know, if they're going to work him away, it, it doesn't really matter. Because then if you try to pull that pitch, you might pull yourself into a double play. Then you'd rather have him running at that point. Ball in a strike and an out. In the 11. Good to see though Tommy that the Clevelander is still going strong out in left field. Oh, they, they just start going strong after 11. This is uh, right up their alley extra innings. No problem. The next time the Mets return to Marlins Park, you and I will be in the Cleveland for the fantasy auction. Oh, that? They're here for the fantasy auction. Oh, nice. Late July. All right. Well, they're certainly working Brantley away, or at least that's where Familia is. Either pitching or missing. So we can yell at Lucas Duda. Left field. Well, the Mets outfield is as deep as you can get without having Duda in the Clevelander. It's up, and it's three and one. Look at, look at how deep they are. I mean, in this ballpark, especially when you. You know, turn around and say, oh, I'm going to get 15 feet from the warning track. You are incredibly deep. And as a runner at first base, Ruggiano certainly has to be aware of that, and he is because he's been checking the outfielders. A base hit, a ground ball base hit in the outfield, you can go first to third. See what Brantley gets, three and one. Ground ball, Davis out there, relay out there with Familia covering. Brantley bounces into a 3-6-1 double play. Hey, let's go to the 12th. The Marlins, Joe Mahoney hamstring out. Giancarlo Stanton with what appears to be a hamstring out. Marlins, here's a look at it, the Stanton injury. This came in the 10th. And Stanton goes down hard. Yeah, you can see him dragging their right leg and putting his hand 
behind that right leg. Hmm. So the question is asked now, moving forward, here are a couple of guys that Matt Diaz, a veteran who is off to a good start in AAA. We and talked Marcel about Diaz Azuna. a little bit in uh, Marlins uh, on deck. Having a good year. Marcelo Zuna back from injury. He's off to a good start. Though we can speculate. And those guys are doing well in AAA. Colin Cowgill, who entered in Ozuna's case, double A. And Ozuna, as you mentioned, was one of the the three stud outfielders in spring training headed to that double A team, and they all got hurt. Ozuna broke his hand running into a fence. Okay, he he kind of came back about the same time Yelich came back. Kristen Yelich uh, struggling in in his first uh, eight or ten games, starting to swing the bat a little better. Cowgill's second AB flips it to right. Remember that's Dobbs out there. And Dobbs makes the catch. Mike Baxter. Chad Qualls trying to keep the the streak going since the fifth when Tom Kohler arrived. The Marlins bullpen has uh, shut out the Mets. Balls working on the eighth inning of Marlin relievers. And a flip over to first. And remember, Chris Valleca at first base. Not a whole lot of experience there. Remember, he started there one game. First time he'd ever played there. That's right. And he got some tough plays yes, in he that did. ball game. So, you know, it just dawned on me that we're getting close to late night with the fish. I don't think we've had a late night with the fish. We'll have some coming up. Absolutely. We go on the West Coast. San Diego and Los Angeles. But for the kids that are staying up with us, we we got to pull something out. Late night with the fish. Justin Turner's got a couple of hits. Now we've talked about the injuries, and, and again, it's worth mentioning Juan Pierre out there with that compression sleeve on to try to keep the, the swelling down on that elbow where he got hit. Pierre hit by a pitch, and his elbow ballooned up right away a huge knot and stayed in the game and as soon as he got to the dugout put the compression sleeve on I would not want to uh, be in the clubhouse when he takes that compression sleeve off you can kind of see the outline of the of the knot and he's he keeps flexing it too on a on a night Say this is the seventh inning of a game where the Marlins have a normal bench. I don't know that Pierre's still in the game. What has been normal about this game? What's been normal about this season? Well, we had that shot. We saw Mike Redmond looking at the uh, the lineup card. He knows in his mind uh, anybody else uh, has to go down with any kind of injury. He didn't have anybody to replace them with. I'm sure Redman right now is thinking in his mind, okay, he's got Miguel Olivo. And after Olivo, he has to start thinking about what starting pitcher would he pinch hit with? Maybe a Ricky Nolasco. If he needed a pinch hitter. Field, so, see, look. See, Ricky said, I'm ready. Center field. So I could play center. I'm sure he played a little center in high school, maybe. Kearns has been used already. 
Coughlin's been used. Turner lines that one foul. So Coughlin's done. And in some respects, Terry Collins doesn't have the uh, options that he would like. We're not sure about David Wright and his neck. Anthony Record, backup catcher. He's he's the only other guy available on his bench. But the longer this game goes, the looser Wright's neck gets. <laughs> Turner has a two-out hit, and here comes Murphy. Turner's third hit tonight. Chad Qualls trying to get one of his skates on this. Well, he knows he has no chance to catch it. So he figures, okay, if I can deflect it to the shortstop or second base, maybe have a chance. Daniel Murphy, a long night, an 0 for 5 night. And we told you Murphy coming in had an 0 for 12 going, so he's on a, an 0 for 17. In that Nationals Braves game, Steven Strasburg went six innings, six hits, two runs, four walks, eight strikeouts. He threw 93 pitches. He apparently is dealing with tightness in his right forearm. Here, the Mets and the Marlins are dealing with the inability to score runs in a 2-2 game. That's a ground ball that's going to find its way in the left field. Round second and headed for third is Turner. Murphy gets his first hit of the night. And now Lucas Duda will come up. That broke an 0 for 17 that Murphy was on. The other thing rich about the injuries and you can see with the in the infield the way it was that ball sneaks through with the outfield playing deep Turner easily goes first to third. There are sometimes you can okay maybe wait a couple of days that that injury might get better hamstring whatever you can't do that you got to You got to make some moves and get bodies here because you can't give your manager a 22 man roster. You don't have a lot of time to do it. Marlins and Mets are back at it tomorrow night. Or in 40 minutes tonight. So Duda takes a strike. Qualls has got that good changeup that he can combat lefties with. Duda's 0 for 3. He's walked twice. Mets are 0 for 14 with runners in scoring position. Okay, between Qualls and, and Webb, they've seen some good sinkers tonight, some good two seamers. Now the 1 1. Driven to center and deep. And Ruggiano is going to have room and make the catch. And Qualls leaves a couple. He's worked two scoreless. Marlins and Mets in an extra inning struggle. 2 2.
get the feeling with the conversation in the dugout Chuck Hernandez had with uh, Chad Qualls and others. You wonder if they're asking him if he can go another inning or how does he swing the bat? <laughs> or maybe both. Jury's Familia is going to stay out there for the Mets. That was after two innings of Bobby Parnell. Nick Green. Chris Valeka. And then Juan Pierre. It's going to be interesting to see it, how Juan Pierre reacts at the plate if he can swing. A liner and a diving catch it short by Tejada. And that'll bring a smile to your face. He's made some nice plays tonight. It's, it's interesting. He's made six errors this year. And in talking to Terry Collins, they feel a lot of them because he's a good fielder. A lot of them early was because of cold weather. They had some nasty weather. Hard for him to get loose, but he's made some good plays tonight. Rob's green of a hit. Here's Valeka, his first at bat. He came in in the double switch after the Stanton injury. Yes, if you're just happening by wherever you might be, whether you're here in Florida, if you're Conk the Caveman. Haven't heard from Conk this year. Maybe tomorrow night. Email on Twitter Tuesday. If we play any longer, we can start taking some tweets and emails. He's got the dish back up on the cave. <laughs> so I think he's ready to go. Aleka, an inside fastball, puts it in the air, and Lucas Duda is there. Heck, I'm all for starting Twitter and email Tuesday early. John Rausch is in the home. I mean, the kids, the kids have stayed up, Tommy. Yeah. And so they deserve a little something, something. Juan Pierre. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if Pierre just tries to bunt here. The Mets certainly are expecting that. And Pierre takes a strike. And we have gotten the official word on Giancarlo. Right hamstring strain. And look at JP, <laughs> the knot on his arm, bangs one into left field. And he's aboard with two outs here in the 12th inning. Well, it's just a, <laughs> just a marvel at the things that he can do. And after that last at bat, and then stepping in and banging out a two out single. Now you got Solano up. He opened the night with two hits off of Matt Harvey. Remember him? Sure you do. 24 year old right hander out of North Carolina. He started for the Mets. Remember Jose Fernandez. He started for the Marlins. Fernandez went four innings. Gave up the two run homer to John Buck and that's the only runs the Mets have all night long. Harvey. Would give up just one run. And was in line to go five and zero. Oh. Become just the third Mets pitcher to go five and zero. Oh in April. But that went out the window when the Marlins tied the game in the bottom of the ninth. You know, you think about the base hits. Juan Pierre has a couple. Donovan Solano, two base hits. Ruggiano, two hits. Brantley, two hits. One oh. Tonight may have been the uh, finest moment of the year for the crack staff. Remember that at bat? Ah, there's a, a pitcher we didn't think of. Wade LeBlanc sw uh, swings the bat pretty well from the left side. The Jordani Valdespin at bat where everybody had the count wrong except 
our Bill Wadelick, who's a member of the, the crack staff on the Fox box. Valdez mm -hmm. actually had walked, but no one knew it, and he ended up hitting a fly ball out. Now, the reason you saw LeBlanc, because Qualls is in the Stanton spot in the order. So that spot is due up next. Pierre is running. Swing and a miss. Bucks throw from his knees. Pierre has the stolen base. So he's in scoring position. But the count's one and two on Donovan Solano. Well, number seven on the year. And he gets closer to 600. Number 598 in his career. To now the visit to the mound because regardless of the count to Solano, they know that on deck is the pitcher. Now what about this though? What about you have Wade LeBlanc on deck, they walk Solano. And you have Olivo. And you fire the Miguel Olivo. You, you could do that. You could do that. So, yeah, LeBlanc is on deck, but Olivo is getting ready. What was it against the Mets that the Hopper in, in New at, York? At Shea. At Shea. I think it was at Shea. Was no, it City Field? It was at City Field. Was it City? Okay. Pierre's at second. There's two outs. It's 2-2. Two -two. It's the bottom of the 12. And Solano down to his last strike. Familia. So Mike Redmond has tried his best decoy moves tonight. And, and he's got a little one going here with the LeBlanc in the on deck circle. But, you know, you never know just in case he has Olivo ready. We saw him earlier in the game when he knew he had a short bench. Well, if LeBlanc is a decoy, he's, he's playing it up with the batting gloves. And we'll find out because they're going to put Solano on. It's amazing that they're putting him on with a count one and two. Why, yeah. would, why would they choose to put him on now? That's why he's got to be ready right here. You yeah. never know. This could be Raleigh Fingers against the Reds in the 72 World Series. That was Dick Williams who pulled that. Yeah, it wasn't Johnny Bench the hitter. I think so. Yeah. There's Olivo. He's kind of hiding down in the dugout. And LeBlanc is headed back to the dugout. Yeah, that's exactly what the Marlins have done. They're going to bring on Olivo. Who. And you never know. I mean, Joe Mahoney might be able to swing a bat, but with his hamstring, he probably don't want to put him in the game in any other situation. And then you risk, if, if he were to get on, you, you risk a worse entry or you risk putting in a pitcher to run for him. And you're just running low on numbers. So here's Olivo. You see four pinch hit home runs in his career. The Marlins would take a single. And if he just gets a, a bloop. This thing's over because the outfield is deep and you got great speed with Pierre who will be on the move with contact with two outs. Get him in that fastball count Miguel. Boy you know if, if Olivo does come up with a hit and win this game the, the move by Redmond to to force the hand of the Mets to decoy and have them intentionally walk Solano with a count one what, and two. On what's Solano. the count one and two. Yeah. Here's the 1-0. Pierre's running, and he's going to take third. And it counts now 2-0. and Boy, Olivo is a terrific fastball hitter. He is in a fastball count. That is another stolen base. They figure, okay, you're not going to look at me. You're just going to give it to me. I'll get 90 feet closer. And we have seen Olivo in his time as a Marlin feast on counts like this. And you would have to think he's going to get that heat. 
Now Solano will take second. That will not be a stolen base. Lebo got the pitch. He got a fastball, but it was way up, so he counts 3 and 0. Polanco is on deck. I think I let him swing away. 3 0, gets that fastball. It's up, and Familia has loaded the bases. That's the other nuance to intentionally walking Solano. And all of this coming with two out. Remember, Green lined out. Then a fly ball out. And then Juan Pierre stepped in and started with a single. And of course, in the meantime, the Marlins rookie manager, Mike Redmond, had waved the block on the on-deck circle with Solano at the plate. The Mets intentionally walked him. Olivo popped out. He's walked. Here's Polanco. Bases loaded. Two outs. Bottom 12. Polanco hit the ball hard his last time up. He lined out to deep right. In. Uh -huh. Now you get a little pressure on the pitcher. Well, it's amazing. Familia had the first two outs, then the Pierre hit, then the stolen base. He was one and two against Solano. And now he can't find the strike zone. Slow ground ball to short. Tejada to first, and Miami leaves them loaded. Goodness. All right. Twitter Tuesday is officially open. Bring them on. You can on Twitter and email. A little late night, Kilvasi. <laughs> Perhaps you would like some champagne. <laughs> I'll say, let's follow the uh, the bouncing ball here. Miguel Olivo is at first. Chris Valleca is now out at second, and John Rausch comes into Donovan Solano's spot in the order. The Mets have John Buck up. Rausch to Buck. Strike one. Laura has the first 
tweet of the night. How was the Cuban sandwich today? Tommy Hutton, you were the first into the Cuban sandwich with a Jose Fernandez start. The Cuban sandwich was uh, as good as they always are, and, and I have to say uh, my respects to the one we had in Minneapolis, the uh, Tony Oliva Cuban sandwich. Very good, but uh, not, not as good as this one here from the uh, Taste of Miami. Our thanks to uh, Emmanuel Munoz who helped me. Arrange that. Swing and a miss, and Roush strikes out Buck for the first out of the 13th inning. Scott Rice, the lefty. John wants to know which position players make the best pitchers in games that go deep into extra innings and why. Now you're you just happen to have a broadcast in which a position player who actually pitched in the big leagues is sitting next to me, Tommy Hunt. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it really matters. I think you, you'll maybe see some outfielders because they have maybe a little stronger arm. But you've seen infielders do it and have success, a catcher every once in a while. So it doesn't really matter because most major leaguers at one time or another pitched in little league or high school. Peeps has got a good tweet. A tweet from Peeps. We've got Peeps, Tommy. Always good to have Peeps. Yep. Peeps wants to know why was Juan Pierre ruled with a stolen base at third base and not defensive indifference. And Peeps, that's because pitcher was working from the stretch and the middle infielders were trying to keep him somewhat close. Yeah, it's a good question. If the defense shows any inclination to paying attention to him, if the pitcher looks back at him, then you lose the whole indifferent thing. These two teams have been indifferent to scoring. Runs. Indifferent to scoring. Yes. Swing and a miss, and Roush has struck out the first two that he's faced. He's punched out Buck, now he's punched out Davis. Mets have struck out 13 times tonight. And these two teams are, I mean, we talk about a death struggle and offensive indifference, which is essentially what the Marlins have had here along with the Mets. These two teams have combined to go one for 25 with runners in scoring position. There's yeah, a yeah, base the, hit. the Mets are 0 for 15 with runners in scoring position. And after that last inning, the Marlins are now one for ten. Oh, we're getting one of the answers. Ah, oh, there we go. I told you, the longer this game went, the more David Wright's neck would loosen up. And so here at 11:41 Eastern Time, he probably has been in, in treatment, getting that neck ready. And David Wright makes an appearance. So the Met captain pinch hits here in the 13th. Roush goes to first. Ross wants to know, Rich, what's Tommy wearing for late night with the fish? I, I told you he slipped on his smoking jacket. Even though I don't smoke. He still have. He's got a sifter of F1. Cravassier. Even though he doesn't sift. Roush misses to right and the count is one and all. You can see how right is kind of peeking over that left shoulder because that's the direction he's had having a little trouble turning his head. 
the neck. A terrific career for Wright and his numbers against the Marlins. Very representative as well. John Rausch in the 13th. We've started Twitter Tuesday early. There's a strike. JB from Minnesota. The Tony Oliva sandwich is not that good. I live in Minnesota. It's all about the Juicy Lucy. We were only there for a day and a half. We did not run into Juicy Lucy. No. That went foul back and out of play. But we did have a nice in between meal at the Loon Cafe. Just down from uh, Target Field. Kevin wants to know at what point do you guys cut away to poker after dark? Two two. It's down low. Well, all of a sudden now, if if Rouch loses right, then the Mets get a runner in scoring position with Tejada getting that two out single. Colin Cowkill is on deck. Then it's Mike Baxter. That one foul back. And that'll bring Tejada back to first base. Francisco. At this point, are you two going to get a late night snack? Are there any tres leches there? I think we're all snacked out right now. Struck him out. Right. Gets run up by Tim McClellan. David Wright says, I sat around for five hours for that. A look. Roush. Joe Espada made the mixed tape. World's most dangerous tape room is wide awake on our very first late night with the fish. With Tommy Hutton, Craig Minervini, Jeff Conine, I am Rich Waltz. Neither team has had any success with runners in scoring position. Scott Rice. Am I missing something or is he the last reliever that the Mets have? He's the seventh. 
I know that. <laughs> That's a lot, and I think he is the last. Here's Dobbs. I like some of the uh, tweet. Daniel has a has a good question. You know, we like the good questions. Daniel wants to know if, if Juan Pierre gets his 600th career stolen base after midnight. Does it count for the day the game started or the date the game ended? I think the important thing is it counts. And at this point, we're not really that concerned. Well, 425 pitches have been thrown. These two teams are still a combined one for 25 with runners in scoring position. 2 2. Mets Marlins. And we're approaching midnight. We've opened up the uh, tweets and the emails. Cameron wants to know who will the Marlins see first, Marcel Ozuna or Christian Yelich? Maybe Matt Diaz. Giancarlo Stanton with a strained right hamstring. I would really say if you were going to choose between Ozuna and Yelich, it would probably be Ozuna because he's off to a real good start. And, and you, you like to bring somebody up who's got some confidence going, sitting over 300, he's sitting with some power. And as I mentioned before, it's been a little bit of a struggle early on for Christian Yelich. Even though we saw Yelich in spring training uh, have the professional at bats all the time. Rice misses down low. In the dirt. Dobbs leading off bottom of the 13th. Ruggiano Brantley to follow. Had a, already a lot of questions. Want to know what the longest game in Marlins history has been? Tommy, since you've been here the longest time, well, time-wise, I'm not sure, but uh, the Marlins had that 20-inning, uh, 20-inning game against the Cardinals on a getaway day. <laughs> Where were you getting away to? To Arizona. <laughs> Beautiful. That was uh, on, on the plane for a four and a half hour flight. Yeah, it was way. I remember that we were. I was actually home, not working, just waiting for that game to end, and it went forever. There was yeah. another one. Yeah, that was on April 27th, 2003. Yeah. There was another one right before the All Star break. I forgot how many innings went, but it was one of those games with rain. Delays. You remember that one, Tommy? It was probably uh, well, 2002 I, or three. Yeah, I'm cheating a little bit. Oh, two, July 12th. Oh, so that had to be around against the. It was at Wrigley Field against the uh, Cubs. Uh, I was thinking there's another one when we when the Marlins were home, and they had a. It was a long, long day. I think went into the late evening from three or four rain delays. Brent has tweeted a couple times wanting to know about the at bat that was supposed to be a walk that wasn't a walk. That was uh, Valdez being back in the fourth. Am I missing something there? He ended up popping out in a shallow left. Yeah. And there were actually four balls thrown, but the count never got above three balls. And the home plate umpire, Tim McClellan, had it wrong. The Mets dugout didn't notice it. The hitter didn't notice it. Well, there you go, Brett. You can hang with us or sleep soundly now. Ruggiano into left field. There's a base hit. Justin Ruggiano with his third hit tonight. Melissa wants to know, and she wants this trending on Twitter. Best position player for the Marlins if this thing gets out of hand. 
and they got to bring somebody in to pitch. <laughs> there are none because they're all either hurt or on the field. I would, you know what? I would think they what they could do is put a Levo on the mound and bring a pitcher in to play in the outfield somewhere. So Wilson Valdez, who the who the Marlins picked up uh, in spring training, that was he's in AAA right now. Last year, he got the win. Yeah. Brantley takes away. Scott Rice, eighth pitcher to work for the Mets, seventh reliever. Eric, very complimentary of the new late night with the fish song. Do you like the uh, the Travis tweet? I'm sure you're you're looking at some of the ones I'm looking at. Tra Travis wants to know if that's the Levon Hernandez strike zone or it's the way past T Hut's bed bedtime strike zone. Chuck is interested in a Tommy Hutton smoking jacket giveaway night for the first 5,000 fans. A special bonus gift would be the sweater vest. Sort of the intercontinental edition of the sweater vest. One, two. That's down the right field line, but it's hooking foul. That one popped out of the guy. The blue shirt's hands. It's a school night, kids. Yeah, but there you go. I mean, if you're going to stay up late, she is wide awake, and now she's got a, a souvenir and something to hang on to when she falls asleep in the car on the way home. Hugo letting us know that he's still awake and wanting to know when the next segment on the Marlins Barber Shop will take place. One two pitch. That would be. We think we, next we, next uh, month, Tommy, inside the Marlins with Frank Fort, the uh, Hugo's Barbershop. We could have uh, Ken Lee as a participant. Now it's late night, but I don't think sarcasm has started yet, Tommy. That's at one. <laughs> Here's a two two. Uh, ground ball out towards second. There's one. There's two. And ladies and gentlemen, give me some of that late night music. Give me something.
because the Marlins had runners at first and third, but scored the run on the first of five double plays the Marlins have hit into tonight. That run coming in to score. In the fourth inning, the big blast of the game, John Buck with his ninth home run off the home run sculpture. That put the Mets ahead 2-1, to one, but in the ninth inning, the Marlins were able to tie it. It got started with a Ruggiano double. A little bloop base hit off the bat of Rob Brantley. And then a sack fly hit by Nick Green was enough to bring home Ruggiano, and that tied the game 2-2. And that's why at the stroke of midnight, well, almost, it's late night with the fish. It's the top of the 14th. It's 2-2. Mets, Marlins, both teams have uh, run through their bullpens. The Marlins bullpen, Rich, nine innings, six hits, no runs, a couple of walks and ten strikeouts. Now you have to start thinking about the game tomorrow night with Kevin Slowey because of all the pitches thrown from the bullpen tonight. And the key stat with both bullpens is nobody left. And that works for both bullpens, too. There's a starting pitcher for the Mets. Sean Markham starts to get loose. And that's the next next thing that Redmond's going to have to start thinking about. And Chuck Hernandez is obviously conferring with Redmond over that. Here's Cowgill, Roush in his second inning relief. That's a fair ball. Polanco, so good. And <laughs> look at Olivo getting a taste of first base, getting his feet out of the way. Hey. And so Olivo. Who came in, remember, as a pinch hitter, stayed in at first. You know, when, when Polanco has to get a little something extra on the throw, he does. <laughs> okay, get the foot out of the way. All right, Miguel. Good job. Well, Calgo didn't give him much, uh, much room there. So went out. Top of the order. Baxter is up. Scott wants to know, isn't Christian Yelich hurt, actually? He's just come off. Uh, he's played about nine or ten games. Yep. Same with Ozuna. He's back and playing. Marisnik is uh, due to come back and start playing as well. I believe Marisnik is scheduled to play some games in Jupiter before heading up to double A. Yeah, and I believe uh, Danny Echevarria played in Jupiter tonight. I got an update. Yeah, Danny Echevarria, Mike Redmond says he's hoping him uh, to activate him on Thursday. If everything goes well, he'll be joining the club. That's what for him. So the Marlins will have to make a move uh, in the infield as well. Both guys have been very impressive. Nick Green's come up. Valeka, of course, been a good utility man. Craig, we're having to fill in the uh, dialogue there. I think, see, at the late night, the batteries start to get low. That's a, that's a good idea. That's, I mean, you're probably right on that. John Roush, though, is out there throwing bullets. He struck out three in the 13th. He's got a punch out here in the 14th. And his battery not getting low. The bullpen's just been absolutely terrific in this one tonight. Cheeseburger Eddie wants to know how come you guys don't have an extra inning reel like the 10 run reel? Well, there's a reason for that. You know, an extra inning game is the reason you're in extra innings, it's a close game, it's a tie game. So we have to keep our focus on the field, with the exception of a few tweaks. 10 run game is lopsided one way or the other. That's right. There are no hard and fast rules in a 10 run game as far as broadcasting go. We're bound and determined to keep our viewership, and so that's why we developed the 10 run reel. Justin Turner would like a four hit night. He's got three already in this one. Two runs, nine hits for the Mets, two runs, 12 hits for the Fish.
Jeremy wants to know where is Dontro Willis these days. He was uh, he had just signed with what the Long Island Ducks when we were in New York. I think that happened when we were in New York. Uh, Vladimir Guerrero and Dontro Willis signing with the uh, same independent ball club. Brett says you guys just spoke to me. I will not sleep until the Marlins win. Hope we, we like that kind of dedication. I hope, Brett, for your sake, the Marlins do win, and you don't have to wait till tomorrow night to go to sleep. Tony wants to know, Tommy, have you ever had a walk-off hit? Did you have a walk-off hit in your career before they called them walk-off? They never called them walk-offs. Yeah, I think I had a couple. I had a big, uh, wasn't walk-off because we're the visiting team, but a big, uh, big hit in Chicago, Wrigley Field. Help get the win for Tug McGraw. High pop. <laughs> Here comes Olivo. <laughs> he makes the catch. Man, he's having some fun out there. And why not? I mean, it's the bottom of the 14th. If you can't have fun in extra innings, then you can't have fun. And Olivo is loving it. <laughs> Tonight. And the Mets already out of relievers have dipped into the rotation. Sean Markham comes in just off the uh, disabled list, so just. Having appeared in one game and kind of a neck and shoulder issue going back to a spring training. Veteran right hander had a, a couple of nice years with Toronto, 13 game winner with Milwaukee a couple of years ago. Tops out about 85. Good off speed stuff. So you you see the uh, the beginning of this game with Matt Harvey, who was throwing 97 and 98. Now you got Markham's fastball at 85. It's regressing, isn't it? <laughs> regressing back to the mean. Nick Green, Chris Valleca, Juan Pierre. That one's pop foul. And it's one and one. Late night with the fish, our first episode. We'll have more, obviously, when we get to San Diego. We've come up with new theme music. We're taking emails and tweets. And that's just out of the reach of Tejada. You know, Nick Green hit almost the same ball. <laughs> this is funny. He, he did not hit this one as well. And because he hit it a little bit off the end of the bat, Tejada almost mistimed his leap 
and it's leaped a little too soon, but back in the 12th inning, he had a line drive that Tejada picked. So second hit tonight for Nick Green. He also has a sack fly. He tied the game with that sacrifice fly back in the ninth inning. Debbie says the Marlins should re-sign Carlos Brano for situations just like this because he can handle the bat. Team Venture watching from Philly has a choice of telecast tonight and going with the late night with the fish and hopefully you've got your smoking jacket on too. Last few innings, the Marlins, when they've gotten a base runner, it's been with one or two out. So the first time in a while, they get that leadoff man on base. All right, now this is interesting. Something from the crack staff, JD, sending us a tweet that uh, Adam Rubin is reporting that the official score says Jordani Valdespin did not pop out with a four ball count. That time had been granted on the first pitch. I think the first pitch was a strike, so maybe he thinks it, it's the first ball. It had to be on the first ball. Yeah, the first pitch was a strike. At this point, a moot point. And a small speck in the larger picture. That is the bottom of the 14th. Baleka, little ground ball is going to find its way into left field. Green to second. And he'll stop there. And so now you've got Pierre coming up. Uh, a little breaking ball. Chris stays back on it. And Valenka finds that hole between short and third. But the Marlins lineup has been jumbled so much that after Pierre in the two spot, you got John Roush. And after Roush, you have Olivo. So here's Pierre. So. You know, Pierre, normally you would think here, Pierre would, would try to bunt the runners up, but. This, this is where you, you, you probably also could use LeBlanc, the left hand hitter, instead of Rouch. Right. But, but I doubt, I doubt but JP it, is bunting. But then if you don't score, you know, you lose Rouch and he, yeah. you're counting on him for another inning or two. So Green and Palenka with hits. Pierre is up. The Mets uh, suspect he might be bunting. I think he's swinging away. The Mets actually had a wheel play on, and the shortstop Tejada was standing on second when the pitch was delivered. Which opened up a huge uh, opening on that left side. Back and forth they go. The Marlins and the Mets have combined to go one for 25 with runners in scoring position. Pierre in the air to left. Duda is there and he makes the catch. And John Roush has emerged from the dugout and is headed right to Joe Espada, which is an interesting sight. Joe about 5'10, uh, 5'9. <laughs> Roush, the tallest man in baseball history. <laughs> that looks like us in the booth when we had uh, Chris Bosch and uh, Shane Battier visitors. Well, he has homered. Yeah, the only, only thing Rouse is going to be asked to do is bunt. He 
He has had a hit. In the major leagues but the last time he did get a hit was 2005. So it's been a while. Markham. Roush. Very nice. Great play. job. Markham flips over to first. Terrific job by Roush. And so now. It's back to Olivo. And remember Olivo was involved in that odd. Bit of strategy in the 12th when the Marlins had LeBlanc on deck. Solano was at the play with a count one and two, and once Pierre stole second, the Mets figured they'd walk him. The Marlins pinch hit Olivo, who then walked, but Polanco bounced out, and that ended a very long 12th inning. Well, Terry Collins has a choice here if he wants, but I think he would probably rather face Olivo than Polanco. Yes. Who's on deck. I think it depends. It depends who was on deck. He could walk Olivo and pitch the next hitter, but I think he'd he'd rather have Markham face Olivo. Markham doesn't throw that good fastball that Olivo likes. Strike. 77 mile an hour changeup. There's Polanco on deck. Miami has 14 hits, but just two runs. The Mets have nine hits, just two runs. Olivo swings and misses at a breaking ball, and it's 0 and 2. Markham, a starter in the ball game. The Mets have used up their bullpen. John Roush, the last Marlin reliever, he just came to the plate. So the, the fish are hoping to get another inning out of him if they need it. And Olivo swings and misses, and he strikes out. And Markham. Pitches into trouble and then out of trouble. And he pitches the Mets into the 15th. Late night with a fish 2 2. Levers. Now Mike Dunn has not worked, but Kevin Slowey's in the bullpen, and he was just moving his arms around like he was loosening up. And Slowey's uh, slated to start the game tomorrow night. Mike Redman does have, unless he doesn't want to use Mike Dunn for some reason, he does have Dunn down there. So many questions and no answers in the 15th. By the way, we've had. Uh, terrific sound all night from Joe Espada. There are some clips that we can't use during the game that have to do with strategy in the game, but we can use them on Marlins Live post game, and we will use them tomorrow night on Marlins Live pregame leading up to game two. And, and we can tell you there's some good stuff. Oh, uh, really good stuff. Yeah. Especially in a game like this where there's so many things going on and 
And thank goodness the batteries have lasted that long in his uh, microphone. So John Roush stays out there. It's the 15th. Daniel Murphy's up for the 23rd time, it seems. Actually, for Murphy, it's his seventh AB, and he's one for six. Well, to, as we have before, describe the futility in, in this game on both sides. The Mets 0 for 15, runners in scoring position. They've left 12 on. The Marlins 1 for 12 with runners in scoring position. They've stranded 13. Got one foul back. We are, of course, in full late night mode. I'm not sure why we didn't have the late night music coming back from break. The crack staff may have stepped out for no a trail mix, apparently. They're out of Corvassier and they're into the trail mix now. They, they've essentially raided the mini bar, is what they've done. Boleka on to first. That was close. But they get the out with Olivo playing first. That it is. That's the uh, late night with the fish official theme music. And we thanks. We, uh, I can't even speak. It's so late. Thanks to all the kids for staying up late and uh, participating on Twitter and email. And of course, the crack staff and the postgame crew out there. Jeff Conine has been out, still has, as many emailers have pointed out, the best posture in baseball. Square jaw, straight back. Looks good in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> Roush ready. Here's the 1 1 pitch. Are you guys talking about me? Yeah, we are. It's late night with the fish. Now you're supposed to loosen your tie, get the smoking jacket, get the crevassier, little sifter going. That's what this uh, beautiful set out here uh, underneath is a refrigerator. That's right. We've got it all stocked. The mini bar. Champagne. Oh, I like the music. Nice. Duda pulls it foul. One and two. It's the 15th inning. The Mets haven't scored since, what, like 8 o'clock. That's when John Buck hit one off the home run sculpture. That a two-run shot. It's confusing to look at the scoreboard here, the massive scoreboard in right center because they don't have room for 15 innings. So they, it's like Lindsey Nelson at the Cotton Bowl. We move ahead to further action with the, the Mets were unable to sustain a drive. So look at this score by innings. They've kind of chopped them off there, Tommy. But uh, you and I who dutifully have kept our scorebooks, we can just gaze back and see where those runs came from. Yeah, right. See, my scorebook, 12 innings and a and the gutter of the page. That's what I've got. See, I got a little, little more. There's a drive to right. That's hit well. Into the gap it goes. It bangs off the wall. Lucas Duda gets into one. And he's got a one-out double. You know, this is, you get to the point, too, where you're both teams, and you've got so much invested here. You've emptied your bullpens. You've emptied your bench. You don't want to lose a game like this because it feels like you've lost two games. You hear the old saying, uh, you know, losing a game like this is is a lot tougher than if you get blown out 15 to 2. And you're right with the investment in this game, uh, injuries, uh, with all the pitchers that, that have had to have been used. Rob tweets, I have an update too. Tim McClellan's strike zone is now dugout to dugout and the height, the actual height of the batter. Please adjust Fox tracks. Here's John Buck and he takes a mean rip, fouls it back. Now Buck, for a guy like Buck who's, who's been in there all night and Brantley 
who's been in there all night. This is not a fun thing to catch 15 innings of baseball. Aside from the home run, Buck's night has been rather quiet, but that home run was a loud one. This was yesterday. This was hours ago. This was 439 feet ago. That was a two run homer. And those are the only runs the Mets have scored. And for Buck, his ninth. He now has 25 runs driven in. Roush misses down low. And once again, the Mets with a runner in scoring position. Where tonight they've gone 0 for 15. Ground ball, Polanco looks the runner back, fires the first in time to get Buck. The mystery of that four ball at bat by Valdespin, Richard has tweeted that he saw a timeout on the third or the fourth pitch of the at bat. That's when the count took a, a turn to the dark side, so to speak. Victor, I'm studying for finals. Give me an energy boost and mention my tweet on the air. Got the rally cap going. Marlins are going to walk Ike Davis. Remember, David Wright made a, a cameo appearance on Late Night with the Fish. But uh, he struck out, and that was it. Exited. No, Tejada's on deck. He has a couple of hits. Mike Davis, 0 for 5 tonight with three strikeouts, lowering his batting average to 159. The Mets with runners in scoring position, 0 for 16. That's a team record for futility for the Mets. And the Marlins haven't been much better. What's that? Crack staff, what's the. The cumulative total for runners in scoring position in this ball well, game. Well, Marlins one for twelve. All right. So one for twenty-eight. One for twenty-eight. There you go. If you're scoring with us at home, what was the great line by Keith Olbermann? If you're scoring with us at home, or if you're watching by yourself. <laughs> There you go. I take Keith Olbermann maybe watching this game too. Keith Olbermann, a huge baseball fan. We yeah, usually we see, see him at City, 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 City Field all the time. Always yeah. great to discuss the game with him. Ruben Tejada, as you mentioned, so maybe a, a, a bit of a curious move to walk the ice cold Davis and get to Tejada, who's one of the med hitters who's got a six game hit streak and two hits. But Roush with a breaking ball is out in front 0 and 2. Roush ready. 0 2 coming. And it's foul back. Chris tweets just joining the telecast sounds like everyone is punch drunk. Actually that's the mini bar that we've ransacked. We've, we've had a few wanting to know if Allison is. Fallen asleep but. Apparently Allison has just. Uh, chimed in. That's nice. Ball in the dirt. Brantley has to go back and get it. And the Mets have the go ahead run 90 feet away with a 1 2 count on Ruben Tejada. Five hundred pitches so far tonight. 
Now you have the pitcher spot. You have Markham do up. But the only man left for Terry Collins is Anthony Recker. A backup catcher. And he's in the on deck circle. Ground ball in the hole it's short long throw Mets have a run Duda scores Tejada beats it out and it's 3 2 here in the 15th and the Marlins who intentionally walked Ike Davis have Ruben Tejada get his third hit of the ball game and also the uh, wild pitch setting up this whole situation not for the wild pitch bases are loaded but with the runners advancing Good play by by Nick Green. Not a chance really to get Tejada, but had the wild pitch not happened, bases would have been loaded. So that was a big play. And so the Mets can rest at ease and bring Sean Markham up because they obviously they want Markham to try to finish this game. Fastball and. Stealing second is Tejada. That will be a stolen base because Oliva was holding him on at first, or at least was around the bank. Now they're going to call indifference, but uh, to me, that's a stolen base. Hut, you want to chime in, or does it? What? <laughs> <laughs> I would say stolen base. Yeah, I mean, Oliva was within. It wasn't like he was playing way behind. Him, they Eight, just ten let him feet of the bag. Yeah. Oh well. Roush working. Mets at second and third. Markham. A Blue Jay of late, and he takes low. Yeah, Allison Williams flew across the country, and the Marlins are still playing. She tweets, "I feel for you." And yeah, we have started an email on Twitter Tuesday. On a really. So what what is uh, a dub going to pick us up in San Diego. Oh she'll be here tomorrow she. Oh she flew this way. Yeah. Oh, okay. Across oh, the she flew to the west coast. It's Twitter Tuesday she's supposed to report for duty tonight. The Contessa. The Contessa. She gets. Uh, special seating on the uh, airlines. Because she's got that special Contessa card. And the Cleveland are still going on. We got that going for us, which is nice. 2 2 to Markham. He swings and misses at a fastball. John Roush gives up a run. Roush finally sees the Mets take a 3 2 lead on to the bottom of the 15th.
Third hit was an RBI infield single. The few, the proud, the tired, the weary masses that have stuck around. For Late Night with the Fish, we, we have our Late Night with the Fish theme music. But uh, someone just wants to go to sleep. That gentleman wants to hang in there for the entire night. And you know what? We, we appreciate those that have hung, hung in here at the ballpark and also those that have hung in at home. Polanco, Dobbs, Ruggiano, and if anyone reaches, Brantley, Green, Valleca. Markham is not an overpowering guy. Polanco has endured an 0 for 6. You go 0 for 6 or 0 for 7 in this game, and your batting average will drop 30, 35 points. Nathan wants to know what time to, at what point would the umps call a game and just go to bed if it were still tied? Allen wants to know, can we get a shot of what's happening in the Cleveland? Here's the 0-2. Blanco flips a, a pop. Davis is there, and he makes the catch, and the Mets have an out here in the 15th. Here comes Dobbs. What is happening in the Cleveland? It even looks hey, like at this hour we're not yeah, sure. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, it, it is so late. Can you give me the how late is it? How, how late, late is it? The, guys, it Craig it's is so late. Is Craig is that's where the body there painted are no women dancers are. Dancers here. The <laughs> dancers have gone home. <laughs> Craig's where'd the dancers go Craig's sport coat is we are still rocking here we're going into what 16 innings now DJ vertigo the Cleveland there's crazy uh, can you just... imagine the disappointment guys of the people coming in and seeing me up here no, well, at this point did they body paint that sport coat on you <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right let me head up to the post game spot. I just happened to come through here yeah oh. just passing by just passing through he's, he's been there four innings here's Dobbs Counts 0-1, and Dobbs swings and misses. You know, you talked about the real contrast of of pitchers that the Marlins have seen, everyone in the bullpen, and now into Markham. Markham is as, as different as anyone in terms of not an overpower. He is a crafty right-hander. Dobbs up the middle, into center field, base hit. And so Greg Dobbs... As his second hit of the ball game. Dobbs now two for six on the night. Yeah, the same thing holds true tomorrow night or tonight for the uh, Mets. With Kevin Slowey to start for the Marlins. Mike Redmond's going to hope for the most and best out of him. And Jeremy Hefner starting for Terry Collins. Alex says, I spent 11 innings in section 36, spending the last couple on my couch. Ruggiano, remember, Ruggiano had that big double in the ninth inning to get things going that tied the game that sent it to extra innings. He has three hits. In fact, his last four plate appearances, three hits and a walk. You don't have great speed at first with Dobbs. Tonight's starter is uh, already started his uh, process of getting loose. Kevin Slowey. I remember we saw him a little bit down there just uh, stretching. So Dunn is up. Ruggiano swings and misses. Vince watching the game with my dad on his birthday. Can I get a birthday shout out for him? Only if his birthday is today. If it was yesterday, no chance. Well, happy birthday. O2 is out. <laughs> this is a good one. Chuck, do official scorekeepers ever listen to broadcasters' opinions after plays and overrule calls after hearing a Tommy Hutton rant? <laughs> no. We just try to make suggestions. But they do watch replays. 
Markham buries one in the dirt, counts two and two. Marlins down a run, bottom of the 15th, late night with the fish. Email Twitter Tuesday underway. Two two coming. Good take by Ruggiano. This late, he's grinding out the at bat. Boy, he, he and you you pointed out too his last four abs, the three hits and a walk. He's had some good ones. Just off the plate. Dobbs dives back in. Now full count, one out. Dobbs doesn't run real well, but you never know. Markham trying to protect a one run lead, trying to finish the game. Ruggiano takes ball four. Dobbs to second, Ruggiano to first, and here comes Brantley with one out. Again, Michael watching up in uh, Toronto. First Marlins game I've watched all season. I hope you're still watching. He, he was calling a Ruggiano home run. So just because Ruggiano walked, I hope you stay with us. So Brantley. Two for six night. Well, the last uh, couple of ABs for Rob have been tough. He's hit into double plays. Now you don't have good speed with Dobbs at second, but you do have good speed with the trail runner, which would be the winning run. Ruggiano at first. Outfield's really deep. Brantley takes out. Green is on deck. You got Valleca after him. Brantley. His hits came. In the second and in the ninth, but as Tommy pointed out, double plays in the eleventh and the thirteenth. There's that off speed change up, slow curve balls, fast balls about 84, 85, and he'll change up off his change up. There's the change up. Look at the bottom, just drop. One one. Ground ball, base hit, right field. Dobbs around third, coming home. Baxter's throw, and he will score. It's tied. Ruggiano to third. Oh, this is fun. That's great to see. You talk about bringing a, a club together uh, in what has been a miserable start to a season. If they can somehow pull this game out and win this game. It will just be unbelievable for this team. Third base hit for Brantley. He's been behind the plate. He's been squatting for four or five hundred pitches. And he ties it with a base Come on, hit. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Well, now the Mets with one out. And green up. The Mets are going to bring their infield in, or are they going to play for two? The infield right now is looking into the dugout to get some direction. Green is up. Markham from the stretch. Brantley's at first. Ruggiano at third. It's 3 3 in the bottom of the 15th. Fly ball, left field. Tagging is Ruggiano. Let's. What a ball game. Hallelujah. It's over. 4-3. Miami wins it. 
How about Nick Green? He hit a sack fly in the ninth inning to tie the game, and the sack fly here in the 15th inning to win it. The Marlins outlast the Mets. An entire bunch heads to the clubhouse. A smashing success for our first late night with the Fish. And Rich, the, the first time this year, the Marlins have won two games in a row. Well, it took five hours and 31 minutes. Like it. <laughs> Who has more fun than we do? No.